John, this is Scott Walter. Hey, Scott, how are you? Well, not that great. I just came from the site, and uh, the government won't let me in. It's bullshit. Interesting. Well, I'd be happy to show you the uh, videos from Track Rock that I shot last year. Well, I'd love to see it. I mean, that's the next best thing, but God, I'm heading back to Minneapolis right now. Could you meet me in my lab and bring the footage? Absolutely. All right, let's plan on meeting tomorrow. I'll see you then. The history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're gonna investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're gonna get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. to see this video oh, here. Oh, I'm glad to show it to you. Yeah. Say, you know, I got to tell you, the government wouldn't let me in. How the hell did you get in and take these these videos? Well, I, I had a permit back in 2011 and uh, spent a day at the site. It's a huge site. Well, I got clips of a number of rock walls that uh, form terraces going up this mountain slope. Maybe over 100 of these. They're just all over the place. Now, you said over 100? Yeah. Really? It's amazing. You know, you walk along, all of a sudden, there's a rock wall and then a relatively flat area. Now, this is a shot from up at the upper elevation. See how nicely yeah. constructed that wall is? Mm -hmm. And then there were some water features, some of these uh, dams that were... Reservoirs or something? Yeah, to control water. Really? And there were some uh, rock cairns up there, uh, some type of ceremonial uh, structures. And, and I even found a, um, a rectangular stone foundation. For a structure of some type? Pyramids, perhaps? Yeah, OK. Yeah. So we have rock formations, extensive terraces to control water, and stone foundations. Is it big? You could get lost up there. The only direction that you would know to get out is to go is down. Go down. Okay. I tell you, if you want to know more about this, and, and this is how I found out about the site, you need to contact Richard Thornton. He's a Native American architect down in Georgia, and he spent um, you know, a decade studying this. Does he think there could be a Maya-Georgia connection at this site? Yeah, and that's what caught my attention. I'll tell you what, John, if the Mayans came to Georgia, this could rewrite history. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. Scott Walter. Richard Thornton, glad to meet you. Yeah, I was uh, visiting down at Chattahoochee National Forest. Yes. Tried to look at some mound structures. I'm investigating a possible connection between the Mayans and Georgia. And uh, tried to go look at these mounds, and uh, I was denied. You're kidding. No, I was denied. First of all, I take it you support this whole Mayan-Georgia connection? Well, it's, I mean, it's not even a theory, it's a fact. The Mayas are one of the Mexican Native American ethnic groups that became the Creek Indians. What are some of the things that to you provide evidence of this assimilation, really, or this coming together here in Georgia from Mexico? We have the architecture. We have the cultural traditions. The art are very similar. OK. Approximately uh, 
third to a half of the words in the Itzati Creek language are either Maya or Totonac. Okay, linguistics. Linguistics. So what about archaeoastronomy? They like the Mayans use with these amazing structures that align with the sun, the moon, the planets for practical and religious reasons. Is any of that going on around here? Yes, very much so. That's, okay, so that's what area I'm a spell. I'm a city planner, so yeah, I'm pretty strong at it, so I can help you there. Do you have any of this I have lots of drawings. I have drawings and photographs, yes. Is that what they don't want me to see? I don't know what they do. Why? It's a, it's a massive site. Uh, what to keep in mind, this place is a half mile square at least. It's a town. Okay. It has over 300 stone structures. It's like nothing else in America, really. It's been radiocarbon dated to at least 1000 AD. What do the archaeologists think about this? And I thought the archaeological community would go gaga. You know, they'd be fighting over the chance to be the one to be the great discovery of all their lives. Would you believe that some professors who had never seen this track rock site, they formed a political action group to oppose anything discussion of the track rock site and it being my unit. Now, why? I don't know, because they're like 600 miles away. So you're asking me if I would believe that the academic community might try to shut down investigation like this? Uh, yes, I would. <laughs> okay. look, look, pal, I've lived it, OK? I was hired to investigate an artifact called the Kensington Moonstone. Yes, yes, I've heard of it. When I came out with these results, I was blasted. And it really puzzled me at first, and then it pissed me off. Well, I've spent the last 12 years investigating these historical mysteries. And when you tell me that there's pushback from the professional or the academic community, uh, I'm interested. That, that's a sure sign that there's probably something going on here. These are some of John's videos. You can see the rocks. Mm -hmm. That's a ruin of a building. It looks like an offering altar with a little hole here. I was thinking that also, if this would have been covered with, with clay and then plastered with, with lime stucco. You know, Richard, I have to say, when I look at something like this, I, I'm not impressed. You know, I thought I'd be seeing these cut, beautifully cleaved work stones and these big temples that you think of when you think of people like the Maya. I mean, right. why don't we have that here? This is what most Maya sites look like before the archaeologists go to work and the archaeologists architects like me restore the ruins. That's what they look at, they're just piles of rocks. Even great cities with, that had 100,000 people will be piles of stones in the jungle. What does this site look like? Can you give me a visual? This uh, is a computer virtual reality model. Obviously, there's some elevation here. It'd be nice to see some topographic lines, maybe yes. a topo map. Of well, now, I have topo maps on my computer. OK, I was going to ask This is a 3D model, but if you'd like to see the actual elevations. I would like to see that. Do you see the Acropolis? You see that? Yeah. You see yeah. that's terraced just like the five sided mound? Oh, this and is... it's facing the sunset of the winter solstice. These astronomically aligned structures, the whole village, the way they're oriented, is very important. There are many monuments, perhaps 50 stone carns, that seem to be markers having to do with astronomy. So, what is this? That's one of the things when I knew it was Itzamaya. When I saw that, I said, oh my gosh. Actually, well, I said some other it? things, but I can't tell. <laughs> tell it is a it device is. that takes the water yeah. from the spring and to drop the water to the appropriate terrace. It's a control device oh, for distributing okay. water. What I'm trying to experiment with here is why did they do it? Why did they build the terraces? I am mimicking the environmental situation at Track Rock Gap, or the Maya civilization grew these crops on terraces. So do you think what we have at Track Rock is connected to the Mayan somehow? Yes, there's a direct connection. OK, why would they not let me in to see this? I mean, it's just terracing. It leads me to believe that there's more going on here. Do you, uh, do you think there's a conspiracy maybe going on? There's here? something fishy going on up there. I'm thinking there's something fishy, too. But I'll tell you what, if they won't let me hike in, maybe I'll fly in. Have you ever heard of LIDAR? Yeah, up and around. 
This is a virtual image of the area that we're curious about. The main thing is if there's something here, we're hopeful that your equipment will pick up these terraces. We're investigating the possibility of a Mayan-Georgia connection. Some researchers think that there might be Mayan ruins on this site. And if so, I mean, we're talking about a huge new chapter of American history being opened up. disappeared around 900 AD. Many people believe that they came to Georgia. You know, I would love to have it come true, but you have to have the evidence. I tried to get to this site, and the government would not let me do it. That's why this was plan B. How does this LIDAR work? Well, what you have in between these two pieces of the system is a laser head and the scanner and a GPS receiver, and they're using timestamps. We're able to create um, a point cloud, which is a set of points accurately mapped and geo-referenced in a few centimeters. Within a few centimeters? Absolutely. It looks like you've set up a grid system, so basically you're just reproducing that grid? We kind of think of it as mowing the lawn when we're up here, because it's <laughs> down and back, and we use some overlap to make sure that we don't miss any grass. So hopefully anything that shows like there was a shelf or any anomalies in the, in the bare earth surface will hopefully show up that. That type of scale, we should be able to get some data. Yeah, some stuff may look like it blends into the ground, and some, right. but any kind of irregular features should still stand out. If we're able to use your technology and, and find evidence of some of the things we see here, there could be a Mayan presence here. That would be amazing to find that out. It would be. Here is the initial look at the actual LIDAR data itself, okay. so the points themselves, sure. so you can see the flight lines that we flew right here. And then down here is a profile of the ground. You can see the trees. OK, and I see the uh, change in topography here. This looks like something interesting. What would that be, um, a bump there? Maybe a, a man-made feature. It looks like it might be one of the features that we're looking for. OK, possibly a terrace, maybe? Correct. This is preliminary, and so what we will do is we'll, we'll take and have to process the data, and that'll okay. probably take okay. a couple weeks to get the, the final data set so that we can verify okay. if that is actually a man-made feature or not. A 3D uh, map, about two weeks, eh? Yep. Great. You know, Jamie, when I started this investigation, I was pretty skeptical. I mean, the notion that the Mayans came to Georgia seemed pretty far-fetched to me. But as I've gone along here, things are starting to look more interesting. If you can generate a 3D map that looks even remotely like this, I tell you what, we could potentially have something that's big. If those features are there, we're definitely going to see them in the data. It'll take two weeks for Aerometric to compile all the LiDAR data, which could help prove a Mayan connection to Georgia. If the Mayans did come here, I wonder if it's connected to their prophecy. The Mayan civilization began in 2000 BC and started to collapse around 750 AD when they began to abandon their cities in mass. They had to go somewhere, and this stone nearby could be a clue they came to the US.
Are you Scott? Yes. Gary Daniels, I presume? That's correct. All right. Great weather. A little wet today, but I got to tell you, I think the rock looks better wet than if it was dry. I agree. What makes this rock specifically tied to the Maya-Georgia connection in your mind? Both cultures, the Maya and the Creek Indians, used the exact same symbols to record the exact same event. Well, you know, Gary, I clearly see these spiral symbols here. Um, we got an indentation in the middle. This one has a couple of different rings with an indentation. And then we have these cupules along the top. Um, I know what I think it is, but what do you see? And my first impression was that it, it's a star map. I believe that this records an event which happened in 536 AD, which was a comet impact event. And that would explain why they went through the effort to carve this into this boulder. This was no easy task. No, it wasn't. And I have to say, Gary, that I agree with you. I'm pretty convinced this is a star map as well. It's an interesting connection with the uh, with the impact and the symbols tying the, uh, the creek with the Maya. I think that's plausible. But this might not be the only geologic clue that uh, makes a connection. Tell me what you know about Maya Blue. Now, Maya Blue was a pigment that the Maya used in their murals, and it lasts a very long time without fading. And I think I understand the reason for that. Uh, Maya Blue is a very interesting combination of a clay mineral called palygorskite that they mix with a, uh, an indigo pigment made from an anneal plant. And there's lots of palygorskite in Georgia, but relatively little of it in Mexico. Gary, I think that the Maya blue in Mexico could have been made with the palygorskite clay in Georgia. There are still sites in Mexico where they haven't found the actual source for the Maya blue. So that's definitely a good thing to look into. So we've got the, uh, the, the Maya blue pigment mystery as well as star maps both there and in Georgia. That's interesting. And those are not the only connections. It goes much deeper than that. Now check these out. This copper plate was unearthed in North Georgia. What's interesting about this is that almost an identical image as this was found at Chichen Itza in the Yucatan. Wow. This looks like uh, some type of uh, shaman or somebody in the middle of a ritual. Is that a severed head? Yep. And you have this in Chichen Itza as well. Exactly. Wow. Are there any other sites that might uh, tie into what we're looking at here? Absolutely. Just a few hours from here, there's a site called Okmulgee. They found an elite burial that showed cranial deformation, a known technique in the Maya world that they also use on their elites. Cranial deformation is a procedure they did at birth where they placed the, the child on a flattened board, placed another board on his head, which forced the, the skull to grow in a certain shape, which gave them sort of a, a flattened appearance to the forehead. With everything I've seen so far, how come nobody knows about this? People have been writing in the literature, the archaeological literature, about this connection for 150 years, but it has become a taboo subject. I'm continually amazed every time I see something new that is changes history in a profound way, and it gets ignored, swept under the rug, and people that even dare to investigate it get criticized. I've been through that myself. You gotta figure out a way to make it stop. Yeah, they say science changes one death at a time, and I think that's what it's gonna take. You know what? I'm not gonna wait for these people to die. Sorry. I'm gonna get answers. Let's go to Old Hoagie. So how long have you been studying this Maya-Georgia connection? Well, I've been researching the Georgia-Mexico connection wow. for about 10 years, but it was only within the last couple of years that I really stumbled on the Mayan presence in both Florida and Georgia. OK. What do you think of uh, Richard Thornton's research? You know, Mr. Thornton has presented a hypothesis, and that hypothesis needs to be tested. Is the track rock site a Mayan site? You know, I don't know. Could it be? Absolutely, it could be. But we're never going to know that as long as the academics are insisting that it can't be. So instead of sitting in your chair talking about it, actually getting out there and doing something. 
Absolutely. Right. Making proclamations about what it isn't serves no purpose. I agree. <laughs> wow. Man. Take a look at this. This is that mound. It's a spiral mound, isn't it? That's without the vegetation. Well, now I can kind of see it. Can we take a closer look? Let's go. All right. We got mounds in Minnesota, but I haven't seen any this big. Wow. One, two, three, four. Yeah, I see at least one, two, four, three. Four, five levels. Even maybe a f fifth one up there. It's, this is cool as hell. Like, there's a site called Zochi Tecatl in Mexico, and it's the only other place in North America or Central America that has a spiral mound exactly like this, where you follow the spiral to the top. Not only that, it's laid out exactly like the mound site here, with the spiral mound on one end and the square mound on the other. This mound, the Creek Indians said, this is where they perform their snake dance. Mm -hmm. And so they march in procession around the mound until they reach the top for their ceremony. There was also Lake Okeechobee. Now, when the Spanish came to Lake Okeechobee, they found three people living around that lake, the Maya Imi, the Mayaka, and the Maya Yuaki. So three people calling themselves Maya. Maya. Is there also maybe a connection to Miami? Absolutely. This is really incredible. I had no idea that there would be a spiral mound here. We have spiral mounds in Mexico. This Maya-Georgia connection is really starting to come together, and I'm feeling it. Gary, you promised me some archaeoastronomy. I see a beautiful mound structure here with a long doorway that's facing pretty close to due east. According to the Creek Migration legend, the very first structure they built when they arrived here was a mound with a central chamber. The doorway of this earth lodge aligned with the sunrise. There's no question that the Mayans also aligned their temples and their structures according to archaeoastronomy. So is this purely a coincidence? Clearly, there was something going on. This is fascinating. I mean, we've got two large mounds. We've got this one here that has an obvious alignment both to the sun and to the stars. We've got that amazing spiral structure, the cranial deformation. I'm dying to go to Mexico. If I can find some of the things that are here over there, We've got something that's huge. Pleasure. Welcome nice to, to the site of Chichen Itza. Everything you see is archaeological evidence. Everything? Everything. Okay. How big is this site? It's really hard to tell. Uh, the, we don't have a full map of the site. I know it took thousands of people to build sites like Chichen Itza. The Maya Empire was massive, encompassing parts of southern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and the Yucatan. Many people think the Mayans died out completely, but they didn't. Even so, something forced them to abandon their major cities beginning around 750 AD and spread throughout the region or beyond to the United States. Oh, wow. You know, from this perspective, it's just like symmetric. It's perfect, the lines are perfect. That's amazing. They were copying the shapes of the mountains. 
So what we're looking at here is really a, a man-made mountain. It was intentionally made to mimic the mountains. I've recently been to a site in North America in the state of Georgia. And one of the things that we did that was amazing, and, and I haven't seen the final results yet, but I saw some preliminary data, was some technology called LIDAR, where basically you fly over an area and it will collect three-dimensional uh, data of the topography of the area. And what we think we see are remnants of man-made structures at the site that are somewhat reminiscent of what we'd see here. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the possibility of contact uh, with the Mayans here, possibly with uh, native cultures in what is now the United States. I think it's very possible. Or oh, you're saying that flat out. OK, well, you agree with the speculation. If we really understand what the Maya did here, and if we really think there was contact, then what we do is take everything that we learn here and then use that as a guide to look for evidence over there. Yes, yeah, I will agree. You can maybe find a Maya there, or you can find a Georgian down here. Well, this building that we have in front of us is the observatory, and it's been proven by astronomers that it's a structure that aligns the different positions of Venus and positions of the sun. So those small little windows up there, they were used to track these planets, track Venus. You know that this window aligned to this part of the year and this one aligns to this time of the year. But there is a connection between architecture, astronomy, and the calendar. Well, this is part of a science we call archaeoastronomy. Right. The other thing that we believe is that creating a building that has alignments with the planets and the sun, you are creating a link between heaven and earth. So the building is the link between the two. In Georgia, I saw a spiral mound. I also saw a boulder that had spirals carved into it. So the spiral is very important. It crossed Georgia, and it seems to connect over here with the Mayans. So maybe that's another uh, connection or piece of evidence we can uh, tie together between the two cultures. Yeah, I, th I think it's a very strong element, and I think it's very important for the Maya too. It's in everything. This is called the Nautilus shell. It's the spiral design. We have something here called the Fibonacci sequence. And it's just simply an, uh, a mathematical calculation where you add numbers sequentially, and it will grow exponentially, creating, in this case, a spiral. Many ancient cultures saw this design, figured out the mathematics of it in nature, and then incorporated it into the architecture and into their artwork. Oh, yes. It's very important to go in the Maya. Buildings are designed in geometric proportions, and they're pleasing to the eye of the human. We're getting very close to the end of the Mayan calendar, which is December 21st, which ironically happens to be my birthday. So, uh, and many people think this is going to be the end of the world because of the Mayans. We are ending the 12 Bactun. That means we're going to start the 13 Bactun during your birthday, and then we're going to spend 400 years more counting days until we get to the 14 Bactun. It's a marker for a new beginning. If the Mayans were here, it will be the biggest celebration you can think about. There will be offerings, there will be sacrifices, there will be ceremonies, because it's not the end, it's just the beginning of something new. But I think it's really important that the Mayans are getting some attention. I couldn't agree more. I'm looking forward to seeing some of the carvings um, at your site here. And uh, there was something that was found in uh, Georgia. I have seen similar carvings, or at least the, the head of the captive on this side. Yes, I think I can show you something similar at the site. You can tell that the person has some sort of a war instrument in his hand, like this one right here. Mm -hmm. He has also feathers in the back, like he has come in this way. But the most striking part is that there's a little head hanging from his uh, left hand with the spears are. You can see that the head is 
almost identical to the one he has there. Maybe a captain, maybe somebody who loves the world. Really, everything that you talked about, I see here. This is pretty compelling, is it not? Yeah, yes, I, think I can see a relationship between the two sides. I see a huge piece to a, a big puzzle of many cultures coming to North America prior to Columbus. And I think we can put the Mayans into that puzzle. And it just completely rewrites the history of North America as we know it. Okay, Alfonso, let's talk about what we have so far. We've got the temples here. We've got similar stone structures in Georgia. We've got the linguistic connections. We've got the iconography of the mural that's so fantastic, it's virtually identical. We've got the archaeoastronomy. I tell you, we're starting to build a pretty strong case here. What can you tell me about Maya Blue? Let me show you. This is the sacred cenote of Chichen Itza. It's huge. This is a giant sinkhole. It's just incredible. Well, this is the most special place in Chichen Itza. This is where it gets its name. Chichen means the mouth of the sinkhole. That means a cenote. And not only is it a water place, but it's also a sacred place to bring offerings. What do we know about the bottom? What's on the bottom? They found. Uh, Maya Blue, they found remains of children between 9 and 10. This is crazy. Why would they throw children in here? The belief is that children are the ideal messenger to the rain god. So you, when you want to please the rain god, you use children as offerings, so you sacrifice them. Okay, wow. Geologically, I've read that down at the bottom of this cenote, there is a four meter or about 14 foot thick layer that is heavily laden with Maya blue clay. That represents a lot of material. How would that much Maya blue get, get in the, uh, the bottom? One good possibility will be that the children were painted blue before being thrown into the cenote. The other thing is that we have other types of sacrifices, the sacrifices that we know that happened in Chichen because we have a carving and a painting that shows a person leaning against a trapezoid stone so they can put pressure in the back and they can use a knife and slice the chest open, and pull the heart out and then offer it to the gods. So they placed them on a rock to arch their body so when they made the incision it would naturally open and then they would go in. Oh. You know, I knew that they used the Maya blue in the murals and in some of the artifacts, the vessels and various things, but I, I had no idea that they were using it to paint the people for sacrifice. That's, that's... Yeah, that's what we assume by the amount of Maya blue in the bottom of the cenote. Is there any Maya blue, the original Maya blue, still on site here anywhere? Oh, yes, there's still uh, some that we can, we can see, and there's still some on inside of the building. I think the Maya blue could be the hard link between the Mayans and Georgia. As a geologist, it just might be the scientific proof I've been looking for. This is a good example of Maya blue. You can tell it is around the, the square. Maya blue was used for painting buildings and painting offerings, and sometimes sacrificial victims. My understanding is that the longevity of this material, why it lasts so long, is because it's made of a very special clay called Palagorskite combined with a blue dye or an indigo dye made from anil leaves around here. It resists acids and it's very durable. Now, this type of clay we commonly see in cat litter. It causes clumping. We also see it in anti-diarrhea medicine because it absorbs the toxins. So this clay material is very unique. It creates a, a dye that lasts a very long time. How long has this pigment been sitting on this wall? Well, the dates we have is about 900 AD. That will be about 1,100 years ago. 1,100 years ago. Indeed. So this unique clay, where would they get this source material? I don't know. I haven't found a single source. Yes, and that's another important piece to this puzzle that we're trying to figure out is we do have um, a very good source of palagorskite in Georgia, and this could be the source for the Mayans. 
And I do have a way I think we might be able to test this so we can compare it to see if this is the same source material as, as Georgia found here. I'm getting really excited about this case. We have the cranial deformation. We have evidence in Georgia of that practice. We know we have it here. We have the wonderful mural that you showed us that the iconography that was virtually identical to that copper plate that we talked about. We have stone structures in Georgia that have a similar layout, at least appears to be a similar layout to what we have here. And lastly, we have archaeoastronomy, which ties all people together, but certainly the culture in Georgia that we're looking at and the Maya people here. We still have the uh, LIDAR data that we need to look at, but I tell you what, this is looking really good. All right, Jamie, show me what you got here. So this is the LiDAR data of the track route site. And so what we're looking at here, this is the side of the mountain that we were flying around with your plane and shooting with the LiDAR. We've taken the trees away. I put markers in here to kind of indicate um, in relationship to the picture that you gave me of the site itself. Are you saying that Richard Thornton's recreation of what he thinks is there correlates with what you found on the, on the LiDAR? In terms of my LiDAR experience, yes. I really? think that there's a very strong indication that this <laughs> correlates very well. You can see it here, here, you can see something here, and then you can see all the little terraces down here. This is amazing. What about the Oak Mogi site? Were you able to fly over there? Yeah, we actually did get oh, down there and we were able to fly it. Right here, what we're looking at is the actual LiDAR data, so how it's represented. This is the spiral site. I think I can see what looked to be the terraces that we saw at the site. There's no mistaking when you look at that image that it's definitely a mound. The spirals appear to be there, and it looks virtually identical to spiral mounds that are down in Mexico. I tell you what, this is really coming together. I'm just, I can't believe it. I mean, we've got spiral mounds that the Mayans built. We've got them in Georgia. We've got archaeoastronomy, both the Mayans and in Georgia. We've got cultural iconography. We've got cranial deformation. We've got linguistics. It's really coming together. All the pieces are beginning to fit. But there's one more thing that I want to do, a, uh, a quick test that I think might be the final piece that pulls this all together to prove that Mayan-Georgia connection. Hey, Adam, mm -hmm. check this out. What do we have? We're going to make some Maya blue. It's a paint that the Mayans made. It was very sacred to them. They used it in murals. They also used it in sacrifice, ritual sacrifices. Paint the victim head to toe in this Maya blue paint, rip their hearts out, and then throw the body in the huge sinkhole they call the cenote. But I think geology is going to solve the question that we're trying to answer here, which is, did the Mayans use Georgia clay, specifically Palagorskite clay? Okay. Using indigo from anil leaves and Palagorskite clay from Georgia, I'm going to make Maya blue. If the Georgia clay in my sample matches X-ray test results of clay used in real Maya blue, then we have a hard geological link between the Mayans and Georgia. Well, basically, what I'm trying to do is to figure out if there's a match between Maya Blue in Mexico and a sample of Palagorskite from Georgia. They did find some sources in Mexico, but there's just not enough sources to explain the amount of Palagorskite that they found. Well, I definitely think we can help you with this, so uh, let's have a look. 
If you're able to make a definitive connection, it will prove to me beyond a shadow of a doubt that we definitely have this connection between the Mayans in Mexico and Georgia. Here we've got the scan that we did. The ones labeled PA are the peaks we would expect for the Paligorskite clay structure. And these ones labeled QU, these are one of the impurities present. And this is the mineral quartz. So these are your signature elements. Now the question is, how did it compare with the actual Maya blue sample? It actually matches almost perfectly. So we have a match, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> you know what? I'm surprised, but yet I'm not surprised, given everything that I've seen. This was the final piece to tie this together. There's a whole host of academics that refuse to believe that there were cultures that came to North America prior to Columbus. And it's bullshit. This is scientific proof of a connection. It's impossible to deny. It's going to make a lot of people very excited. Richard Thornton, uh, one of them, who's a researcher that was adamant that there was absolutely a connection between the Mayans and the people in Georgia. This testing here not only forces us to re-examine this chapter of American history, but it demands that we open up the whole book to get to the truth of what really happened. Mayan prophecy does declare 2012 as a turning point. Maybe not the end, but the start of a new Baktun, a new beginning. A new beginning might have been what the Mayans were looking for in Georgia. Whatever it was, it must have involved archaeoastronomy, some sort of alignment to the stars. There are so many unanswered questions still out there. What I've learned about where they went and what they believe is just the beginning. There's more to America than we realize. We have the right to question the history we've been taught to examine things with our own eyes. My job is to explain the unexplainable, to find the answers to questions about our past when no one else will. history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're going to investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're going to get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. Dear Scott, my name is Paul, and I live near Tucson, Arizona. While hiking in the Mustang Mountains, my friends and I came across a cave. There's Native American rock art inside, but that's not why I'm writing. There's a stone with the mysterious inscription outside the cave. I think it's a message written in runes. I know you've done a lot of work with rune stones, and I'd like your help figuring out how old the stone is and what it says.
Hey, Paul? Yeah, this is Scott Walter. Say, I got your letter and I'm looking at these pictures. I want to see this stone. That was a hell of a ride. How did you guys find this place? Oh, well, the story starts with me, I guess. I was over in the other side of the valley in Elgin, and there was an old guy that was a retired rancher, and he said, you know, over there's the Mustang Mountains. And he said, when I was a kid, they said there was a lost archaeological site over there that's long since been gone missing. Okay. And that's what, three, two years ago? Oh, uh, two years ago. Well, actually, what we were doing is we're, we were looking for places to climb. Okay. So we had our climbing gear on, and just so happened that one day, uh, we come around that to, over to this wall here. We, we, I said to Paul, well, Paul, let's take our gear off, and we'll see if there's any places to climb. As I was walking in, mm -hmm. said, man, Paul, look at this. Ah. And Paul was amazed, and he said, man, this place is great. Actually, look I think he's it. being polite. He disappeared in this cave, and all I heard was, oh, sh <laughs> That was what you said. Yes, I did. Yeah, and Paul comes in there and he's looking. And he says, "What do you think this is?" Oh, I says, it "Looks like an archaeology site to me." I says, "Look at all these markings on the wall here." There were petroglyphs and pictographs, you know, the finger paintings and the carvings on the wall. But when we looked outside the cave, there was this about a coffee table-sized rock, and it had um, looked like runes carved in it, maybe really? five or six lines. Okay. And it just didn't look like it matched what was in the cave. That's why we're here. Okay. I appreciate your sending me that letter. I really do. Now, I just want to <laughs> let you know what you're in for tomorrow. All right. Okay, right off here to my right here. You see, we're going to go down into this wash. So we're going right up this way here, right? Yeah, that we're green, okay. uh, that green uh, ribbon. Okay. It's pretty much of a rock-strewn scree. So you take one step up and two back. It's yeah. going to be hot tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I saw they were saying it's going to be 99 degrees tomorrow. 99. Okay, so I advise early. So we can start up there, get away from the heat, and it'd be much more pleasant to walk. Okay. See you tomorrow, Scott. Bud. I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready. Who's your friend? Steve is the state archaeologist for Arizona. Scott Wolf. Nice to meet you, Steve. Thanks Good. for coming out. You bet. So, have you been here before? I was here. Luckily, these guys called me, yeah. uh, told me that they had uh, located this cave. We thought it was important to come down and take a look and see what was going on. We found out that it was uh, recorded uh, with an Arizona State Museum site number uh, in 1984. Well, I'm kind of anxious to see it. Let's get going. All right, yeah. I'm in. Let's go. All right, let's, let's head for the cave.
Cave. Scott? Right here? Right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that. Wow, those are rooms, all right. Wow. That is a Christian-style cross, for sure. And these sure look like rooms. That's an R. Not sure what that is. That looks like an S. So I'm not sure. Those, those don't look like Scandinavian ruins. It might be Anglo-Saxon, but you know what? I have an idea. I know a guy who knows something about runes. He knows a lot about runes. I'll send a picture to Mike. Weathering is key, obviously, and that's sure. what, what I'm trying to get a, a sense of. You know, they look kind of fresh to me. I mean, this, this spalling here, uh, I don't see any weathering of that. If, if this was exposed for a long time, um, and the calcite was deposited on this open surface, um, you know, that should, process should continue and you would probably see it there. What I do know is this, this area was recorded as an archaeological site in 1984. Okay. And even though they recorded a lot of the petroglyphs and pictographs that uh, is in this cave here, they didn't say anything about this boulder out in front of the cave that had these ruin writings on it. Okay. So my guess is it may not have existed prior to 1984. So the, the true mystery really is, you know, who put it in here and why, and okay. what does it really say? Is it possible they just didn't record it? No, because usually when they record an arc site, whether there's prehistoric artifacts or historic artifacts, or even if they find any paleontological stuff, they will record everything there because it's all part of the site. This is my handy portable microscope. Here's your lens. See how light that is? That's where the chisel hit the rock, and that's where it spalled off. Well, that's cool, but let's see what else is here. Do you guys, do you see this? What, that Steve, break along the Steve, do you see this here? Right here? It's over on the other side, too. Look at this. See these rock fragments here? And the water was running down here, and it was dissolving out the limestone. And it looks like it cemented these rock fragments here. And it connects over there. There was material here. It does look like this has been dug out, and that boulder didn't move. You know, that maybe makes... that's why in 84 they didn't see it. If this was still covered up, and then somebody's come Somebody back dug and this up. dug it out since then. It or... was uncovered. That could explain why there's yes. no weathering. You Excuse me. The, uh, One sec. Toes? My phone vibrated here. I think it, maybe it's Mike here. Let me check. <laughs> he thinks it might be a memorial stone? Huh. He's got to do some more work on the translation, but a, a gravestone gravestone. Everything about it, including its placement outside the mouth of the cave, reminds me of the stones throughout Europe used to memorialize the dead. That's that, interesting. That's yeah. interesting, isn't it? It is, yeah. There could right. potentially be something in that inscription that identifies a family, a clan, a person, right, exactly. something. You know, if this is a, a grave marker, we could have a body right here. He says it looks like a memorial stone, a gravestone, a gravestone. Huh. Well, that makes some sense. Yeah. And it's got that Christian cross. It does cross. have the cross on there. That's perfect that's, for a gravestone. That's absolutely for, uh, would be on a memorial stone. He's probably right. That makes a lot of sense. He says he'll get back with the, uh, more on the inscription, but the, uh, the material that's welded on the side of the cave tells us clearly that 
a lot of material's been moved mm -hmm. or dug out. Maybe we had a body here. We may have, if, they, if somebody had been buried up here and then somebody wrote the inscription. But as you can see, a lot of it's been removed. And But we still have, you know, we still have some material here. This, we got, this is, looks like somebody has actually dug it out, you're right, and piled everything on that side. And that's a typical example of vandalism. People come out and they find archaeological sites, and the first thing they want to do is start digging. And you know, if they start at the front of a, of a structure like this, they they think they might find something, and a lot of times they don't find anything. The only thing that we know of that's that is here are some very interesting pictographs and petroglyphs. These spirals here. <clears throat> These are really interesting. You know what this strikes me as? Because I've seen these spirals before. It reminds me of a star map. We saw them down in Georgia, and I've seen them in other places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Archaeoastronomy, that's a big field these days. I know that spirals uh, often uh, mimic something that the ancients uh, felt very strongly about, and that's sacred geometry. Sure. And, uh, you know, we see it all over the place. Most people don't realize it. It's, uh, it's how a plant grows, it's how a shell grows, and it's really a mathematical equation, and it's, it's how our faces grow. We know that there are cultures all around the world that did similar things, and yeah. so it begs the question, at least to me, was this all done independently? I mean, obviously, they're all looking at stars, but was there also maybe some exchange? of information, I don't know. Well, it depends on how far back you go. If you're going back, you know, 8, 10, 12,000 years as people migrated through, uh, they brought that knowledge with them. So either they migrated down from the north or they, you know, came across the oceans and migrated from the south. I mean, there's both those theories out there. Sure, sure. And if there was contact whenever it happened, this would be something they would have in common. What the, uh, look at that hole back there. That cave keeps going. Yeah. Why don't we take a look there? Well, I'm not going to fit in there. <laughs> I can't get in here. Is there anybody else? OK, Jim can try it. All right, Jim. Jim, you up All for right. it? All right. Jim's up for it. Just be careful in there. Yeah, be careful. Do you have a flashlight, flashlight or something? Yeah, I got a flashlight, but I'm going to have anything to... rattling, make sure you stop and come back <laughs> yeah, out yeah. real fast. Yeah, it's nice and cool in there. Ooh. Yeah. there we might have me. our body after <laughs> all, right? Yeah, right. ghostly sounds. <laughs> Here, I'll hold it. If you any rattling noises, stop and look and move back. Jim, it's nice knowing you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's bees in here. Is it a hive? I don't know what's in there, but it's there. There's bees in here. Wow. Just a hole right up. God damn. There's bees in there, bud. Yeah, all right there? Yeah, I'm all right. All right. Man, taking one for the team. So, Jim, would a body fit in there? Yes, it would. It would? OK. How, how high was it? I'd say about eight feet. OK. And it goes up on a slant like this. OK. And then it goes up, and then it kind of stops just like this right here with holes all over the place. You didn't see any bones or anything in there? No, no bones. OK. There. I mean, there's a couple thoughts. One is, could there be some other archaeological remains that might tell us something? And would it be worthwhile going through that material that we're assuming, I'm assuming, maybe you are, that they moved that material out there? Would it be worth going through that? Is there any chance we could do a dig here? Um, there's always a chance you can do a dig, but it's a very lengthy permitting process. Really? So you have to get a permit, an Antiquities Act permit. You have to get. Uh, which, uh, and, and you have to have a qualified archaeologist to actually be on the permit to, 
and then you have to hire the crew, and you know, okay. it's uh, there's always that possibility, okay. but uh, you know, it does take some time to get all the permits in order. Let's say we did a dig here, and we found something that indicated a European presence, pre-Columbia. I think you would agree that would be a historic discovery. I think it would be very historic because, especially with the inscription here, to find some some human remains that are associated with these would be very significant. We have multiple lines of evidence. We've got evidence of, of digging. Clearly, there was material here. The lack of weathering that bothered me at first could be explained by the fact that it was simply buried. It could have been. We've got a dry climate here. Um, you know, we've got enough here that if we were to find something from a dig, it would be uh, potentially a big deal. Mm -hmm. Somebody carved that into this rock because they really cared for the person enough to do something like that. They didn't just bury him out in the desert someplace and walk away. Another thought in the testing business, which is uh, what I do for a living, we do ground penetrating radar mm -hmm. on uh, concrete all the time, and would that work here, and, and could we do that? Look, uh, ground penetrating radar isn't really ground disturbance. Um, it's just okay. moving some piece of machinery, electronic machinery across the surface to see if you can pick up any kind of anomaly, so I don't see a problem with that. I mean, uh, you know, maybe it's worth going through the process. Yeah. I mean, we've got a lot of things here that um, are adding up to uh, something that might be worthwhile. Mike, you've got a name? So you're telling me we might really have a dead Englishman from the 12th century buried up in the Mustang Mountains? We thought the last time we were here, there might be a body. Guys, um, I have something to tell you. I've been sitting on this all morning. I got a translation from Mike. And uh, I wanted to wait till I got up here so I could see it and read it and so we could do this together. I'm going to read this to you, but the other thing that he did say is we know for sure that it's 12th century English. So we've got that for sure. But here we go. Uh, line one. The body, in parentheses, he has in contrast with the soul, fits lays rough hurric here. Yeah. He enjoyed, in parentheses, in, uh, entertainment, joy, merriment, maybe means a good life. The secret stolen at the end of this line. Um, rough hurric's body, fame, and glory. Dust beyond Eden, Eden's temple. There's a name here. This well, is sounds like a memorial. This is absolutely a memorial. And then, of course, we have the the Christian cross here. I I, well, I don't 12, know what else it could be. Well, yeah, 12th century. Why would somebody uh, carve something like this that's got 12th century? Uh, letters and everything when we don't have any any history of anybody else other than Native Americans being here up until you know 15 16 1700 <laughs> 
So your initial reaction is this is not 800 years old? I Probably not. Okay. Probably not, okay. yeah. Well, that's fine. That's fair. I, uh, I hope we can prove you wrong. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> you know, you really have two uh, working hypotheses here. You've got somebody messing around relatively recently, or we've got something here that absolutely changes history in a profound way. If there were Europeans out here in the 12th century, it does change history profoundly. Well, I like this. <laughs> I'm getting intrigued. It's an interesting story. I like the story. I mean, I'm always open-minded about different things, and especially something that's absolutely new like this that would really change, you know, you know some of the history. Brad, we brought you here for a reason. What can we do here today? Well, we'll definitely try to scan out in front of the uh, the memorial here, and then we're going to do a couple scans uh, back into the cave, okay. um, looking for uh, any kind of disturbances in the soil. If there's anything left, Brad, <laughs> you're the man. Brad, uh, you're, you're fired up. Uh, looks like it's running. Can you, you just go. explain to me how this works? Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to scan over an area. Okay. Uh, basically, the radar is going to shoot down at 45 degree angles, OK? As we move along, basically, it's going to keep shooting those 45 degree angles down. Okay. Uh, as we pass over anything that may be in the ground, it's going to show up on our screen here. OK. OK? Can you tell by looking at this, whether it's metal, whether it's rock, whether it's plastic? If it's metal, it's going to show up bright white on the screen. Uh, okay. If it's plastic or any other material, it's going to show up as a very faint uh, line on the screen. All right, do your thing. Explain to me, it looks like we have a linear feature here. Is that the, is that that's, the surface? That's the depth that we're actually getting with the radar. OK, what is this little dip in the middle here? Uh, that's just rock okay. that could be in the ground. So if I can cut to the chase, are you telling me you didn't, didn't really see anything, did you? Not on the first pass. We have to do multiple passes. Anytime you scan anything with GPR, you definitely want to do multiple passes. All right. So we're going to back it up. We're going to do it again. area if we go from here on back is where we're seeing that density change in okay. the ground. Okay, right here, right? That light area? Yeah, so basically from here back is where we're going to find that area where we have the density change. Okay, so what you're saying is that could be something. It could be, because there's definitely a density change that we've picked up on every oh. pass that we've had. <laughs> well, I like that, and you we made, what, three passes, and we got that same anomaly here, so do we need to do more passes, or do we want to try out on the berm there? Let's try scanning out here and see what we get out there. OK. That's an anomaly, too. Same thing, the same spot? It's pretty close to the same spot. Pretty. Right about there. So there's something, something here. Yeah. Well, it's consistent. It kept hitting in the same spot. Goes at least to here, right? Correct. OK, all right. Hey, Steve, do you have a sec? What'd you find? <laughs> well. Brad, you thought, uh, I mean, I saw the, the uh, density change, and it's at the same spot, so it's going across here, right? Yeah, it's okay. there's definitely an anomaly in the surface. OK, so it's going in a linear fashion. You know, we've all been to a cemetery, right? 
And the headstone is at the head end, typically. Right. OK. They lay the body perpendicular to the stone, right? This good. Way. How far down? Uh, it was about three to four feet. Three to four feet. Three to four feet. And OK. And it goes out to what, a it two here? foot? About where your, about where your foot is, uh -huh. right? So about two and a half, three feet, yeah. Okay. Obviously, we're not going to dig with a shell. But, I mean, we've got a legitimate, legitimate chance of something really yeah. major. I being. think we can certainly move forward in, in looking for future investigations and seeing what else is here. Because this is a very interesting site out here. Right. We also have something that could be, not, I don't want to say modern, but, but it could be some almost prehistoric uh, Anglo-American that might have been out here. Possibly pre-Columbian. Pre-Columbian. Right, yes. right. Um, just a second here. Oops, I get another. Guys, I got an email from Mike. Guess what? Hurek's surname, he found it in England. How about that? Incredible. <laughs> wow. I guess I'm going to the UK. There is one more thing. Mike says I need to go to the Gila Cliff Dwellings in New Mexico. I wonder what's there. There's evidence of a medieval Englishman buried in Arizona way before Columbus was ever here. I'm finding answers. Pretty impressive, aren't they? Oh, uh, amazing. Scott Walter. Scott, Steve Riley, superintendent for the monument. How are you today? Nice to meet you. Good I'm to meet doing you. Doing great. Uh, what you're looking at is uh, three of the five cliff dwellings. Um, they date back to about 1284, 1285, when they were first started construction. And they were abandoned by about 1320 to 1330. OK. So one, one generation or a little more occupied. Well, um, this may seem uh, a little strange, but I just came from a site in Arizona, in the Mustang Mountains. It was up at the top of uh, uh, a large bluff. There was a cave there, and there's some talk about a, a body possibly being there uh, of somebody who could have come from Europe, from the British Isles, back about this same time, believe it or not. And um, a friend of mine suggested I come here, and I'm wondering, do you uh, have any thoughts? Uh... Well, we have not found any relics here to that period of European settlement. Okay. Everything that came out of here has been dated back to the Native American. OK.
you, Alan? Scott, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great. How, how are you? Long since I saw you. Yeah. How's Jenna? She's doing great. How about Kate? Oh, she's absolutely fine. Jeez, you're right to see you. You're looking awful skinny, pal. Oh, yes, yes. I'm wasting away, you know. You look great. <laughs> So let me ask you this. What have you learned about our friend, Mr. Ruff Urich? I've been doing some investigation at the county records office, and I've found some information out about a Peter Hurek. There's more information to come, and the lady at the office said she'd get back to me by far this afternoon. You know, Alan, it's incredible. We've got this name, Hurek, on a boulder, in a cave in Arizona in the US, and it brings us back here to the UK. Absolutely. It's amazing. It's amazing, but not as amazing as what I'm going to show you now. Oh. Just come with me. Let me grab my backpack. We'll, we'll head out. Here. Still you was in the backpack? I got my whole life in here. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> On the inscription, it says Ruff Hurek, but you said Peter Hurek. Yeah, yeah, I thought about that, actually. And it occurred to me, you know, um, in those days, it was quite common for people not to be known by the real Christian name, but often by a nickname. So I think the word oh. Ruff is probably an adjective. I mean, think where they were out in those mountains. You oh, know? Yeah, yeah. This guy was probably a bit of a bruiser. <laughs> Maybe this was the guy that personally wrestled the buffaloes to the ground. And at that time, uh, especially in Britain, nicknames were very, very common. In fact, they were much more common than uh, proper names and often even used on documents, so... Really? Yes, it was quite a common thing. Ah, sandstone. Yes, I wonder if it just starts to look somehow slightly familiar. <laughs> So there you are, Scott. What about that? <laughs> wow. Now I see why you and Mike wanted me to see this. <laughs> this is reminiscent of what we saw at the Gila cliff dwellings in New Mexico. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, look at how it's carved out beautiful, these rooms. You know, we, we know we have Ruff Hurek, or Peter Hurek, if that's who it is, carved on a stone in New Mexico. Dates to about the 1200s. This goes back at least that far, or oh, do we know for least, sure? At least, we think at least 1500, but it's quite likely that there were people here before that. Well, okay, so now what I'm thinking is this architecture that looks so much like what we saw in New Mexico, did Hurek bring it over there and educate the natives, or did somebody come back, he's still there, and, you know, bring it here? I guess we'll never know, but the one thing we can be sure about is the contemporary nature, you know, of the timing. Um, it's hardly likely to be a coincidence. No, no, there's too many coincidences uh, for, th for this to be a coincidence. Uh, and there's something else interesting about these, of course, as well. This is uh, reputed to be the place that J.R.R. Tolkien used uh, when he devised his hobbit houses. Ah, OK, so these are the hobbit houses. Absolutely. Why not? I've got one more surprise for you. I know from the county records office exactly where uh, Peter Hurick lived. Around here? And it's still here, and it's only five minutes away. There's a rune stone outside a cave in the middle of the Arizona desert. It seems to be an epitaph for an Englishman from 1200 AD. Could he have made a voyage to America hundreds of years before Columbus? I've traced his roots here to Staffordshire, England. It's a pub? Yeah. The lady at the county office told me it was a manor house right back to the 1200s. Oh. And that's where Peter de Hurek lived. So this is Hurek's house, I guess. Absolutely, and it's a pub, and that's why he was rough Peter de Hurek. <laughs> Perfect. Alan, those, uh, those cave dwellings were amazing. 
And you know what I think probably happened there? I mean, you've got these beautiful sandstone bluffs that were there at one time. And when people first came, they probably were hollowed out a little bit, and they just took advantage and, and dug them out even more. The, the architecture is very similar to what I saw at the Gila uh, dwellings. But the one thing that's troubling me here is, you know, they talk about at least 1500s uh, for this site. They have to be older than that. I don't think, Scott, that there's any doubt about it whatsoever. And I would be stunned if, if those rock dwellings were not much older. Oh, I'm, I'm certain that they are. OK. I've got a text coming in. I wonder if it's, oh, yes, it's from the, uh, the Staffordshire Records office. Hi, Alan. I'm afraid I couldn't find any records for the Herrick family after around 1,200. After 1,200. Mm. Well, actually, not finding that name in the records supports what we saw in Arizona. He would be the one to carry on the name, but if he never came back, which appears to be the case based on the memorial, yeah. that's why the name died out. The name disappears. That's consistent with our story. Absolutely. That makes sense that this actually did happen. Yes, because it would have died where he died. And of course, it could never have appeared in the records again. You know, this brings the question that has been burning in my brain is, why would he come all this way to the desert region of the Southwest of what is now the United States? Um, to me, what makes sense, we know down um, in that area we have uh, lead mines, we have silver mines, we have copper mines. Uh, perhaps it was mineral, maybe it was wealth. And, and maybe it was adventure. Uh, I mean, I've always believed, ever since I've been researching this situation, that every man and his dog from England knew that America was there. That fishermen, for example, from Bristol, which is not too far from here, they used to fish on the Grand Banks off Newfoundland. They must have known that America was there, and lots of other people besides. But of course, you don't kill a goose that's laying a golden egg if you know that there are big opportunities uh, over the pond. And resources. And resources. You're not going to run around the country telling anybody else that they're there. We certainly have the motivation, plenty of motivation. It would have been done in secret. And this boulder with his name is really the only evidence that we have that he made this trip. OK, well, let's take a look at what we have here. We've got a surname, Hurick, both carved on a boulder in Arizona and here. Yeah. And we've got a runic inscription carved in Anglo-Saxon runes in a cave down there. And certainly, this is where they, they were used at this time. I mean, it, it seems to me we have a very compelling case that's coming together here. This man came over to America prior to Christopher Columbus. And this would just be another example of the many examples that I'm aware of, of cultures coming to North America prior to 1492. And I have to say, as a, as a historian, having looked at this closely, for my money, uh, on a balance of probabilities, I think we're talking about the man who came from here, who probably sat in this very manor house we're sitting in now, and who ended up all those miles away. And for that reason alone, I think we ought to propose a toast to Peter. To Peter. My investigation into a mysterious runestone in the Mustang Mountains has turned up evidence that a 12th century Englishman could be buried in the Arizona desert. An archeological dig could reveal even more. If there's a man buried there, I wonder what his journey to America must have been like, what he came here for so long ago. I think he was just one of many people who came to America long before 1492. Columbus wasn't the first European to discover America. He was just the first to get credit for it. And that's what I'm trying to change.
history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're gonna investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're gonna get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. I'm heading to Isle Royale in Lake Superior. Here in the Great Lakes region, more than a century ago, an incredible relic was found. A tablet with cryptic symbols. Symbols, I think, are the key to unlocking an epic, unsolved geologic mystery. This area was once home to some of the largest copper deposits in the world. Billions of pounds of copper lay hidden underground and someone knew that. At some point prior to Columbus coming to America, much of the Great Lakes copper disappeared. And I'm here to figure out where it went, who took it, and why. So George, you're probably wondering why I asked you to take me out to Isle Royale. Yeah, what's up? Obviously, um, you know, Isle Royale was a place, I know they did a lot of mining. Yeah, you bet. Love looking at the mines, they're all over the place on the island. How many, uh, how many mines do we think are on Isle Royale? Do we have any idea? They're all constantly finding new ones. You know, some of the estimates for their region is five to 10,000. Whoever was here mining uh, thousands of years ago yeah. took a lot of copper out of here. What kind of, what kind of quantities are we talking about? Between a, a billion to a billion and a half a million? pounds. A billion. A billion? To a billion and a half pounds of copper. How long would that take? I mean, my God. Well, one of the estimates from one of the engineers was 10,000 people for 1,000 years. That's mind-boggling. I mean, when you talk about these numbers, it's so vast. And I know that the Native Americans did use copper, but you know they've never found anything even close to the type of numbers that you're talking about. So the question is, where did all that copper go? I think I know. Um, I'm, I'm firmly convinced that it's connected to the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age in Europe? In Europe, yep. I think people who came over here, this is where they got the copper to fuel the Bronze Age. Who took the Great Lakes copper? Where did it go? To answer that question, I have to go back to the point in human history when copper forever changed the world, the Bronze Age. 5,000 years ago, Man learned to combine copper and tin together to forge an even stronger metal, bronze. It was a game changer. Now, he could make more useful agricultural tools and more deadly weapons. Things like daggers, swords, and axes. With more weapons came more advanced warfare. Nations became more powerful, rising up in an attempt to spread their culture around the world, all thanks to copper. But where did they get it? While sources for copper can be found throughout Europe, in places like the Swiss Alps, England, and Ireland, some people question whether there was enough mineral ore to account for the massive amounts needed to fuel the Bronze Age. I'm one of those people. And this tablet, found in Newbury, Michigan, could prove it. Check this out. What's this? It's a Newbury tablet. You know, I think it could be a key here, um, tying together the copper culture, whoever was at mine here thousands of years ago. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore, but uh, this thing was found 1896 over by uh, Newberry, Michigan. A couple of guys tipped over some trees. This thing was in the ground. It's got 140 characters on it. So the tablet's gone? It's gone. Oh, yeah, man. It apparently was destroyed. You know, this is in beautiful condition, but how many great artifacts have we heard about? They're gone. This could be a link to the copper culture. And I'm thinking it's all speculation, but it could be a way. I mean, if they're mining the kinds of you know copper that we think they were, they had to keep some type of records or tabulations. 
this could be connected. I know that uh, going back, copper was actually more valuable than gold and silver. So that's a pretty strong motivator to come all this way. It's the mystery around here. When you read the old papers from, from uh, the early explorers that came, there's no remnants of who. You know, one of the other things that's really important was the purity of this copper here. Copper, like most metals, has a unique fingerprint. I can test the purity of copper in the Great Lakes and compare the results to the purity of Bronze Age copper to see if it's a match. The big question is, where did the copper come from that fueled the Bronze Age? You know, we're talking 5,000 years ago. This might be the only clue that ties it together. This place is fantastic, George. It is awesome. I know you spent a lot of time out here. Um, why don't you tell me, tell me about the island? Well, it's a, you know, it's unique. It's a national park, so it's well-preserved. Been a lot of different cultures that have come through here, from fishing to mining. It's the largest island on Lake Superior. It's 45 miles long and eight miles wide. It's kind of hard to get here. You know, it's 50 miles from Copper Harbor. You have to take the ferry over, or, or if you have a big enough boat to do it yourself. It has a unique Wolf population as well. Hey, I've read about that. I guess the wolves are struggling, aren't they? The wolf population is dwindling, and they're worried about it becoming extinct. What are the numbers down to now? They're down to nine this last winter. Nine? Uh, I know their disappearance is a mystery, just like the disappearance of this copper is a mystery. So here we go. This is uh, this is an example of one of the pits on the island. Uh, this this pit could very well have been uh, one of the ancient pits, but we do know that it was worked by uh, miners in the 1840s. Oftentimes, the more modern miners, the European uh, miners that came over and, and explored for copper, found ancient pits and worked over the top of them. It just went crazy in the area, and the entire Keweenaw Peninsula became one giant mining site producing more revenue from copper mining than, the, than the, even the California gold rush. Wow, that's, that's a lot of copper. And speaking of that, um, I think you said 5,000 years is one of the numbers you tossed around as the age of some of these pits. How do you know that? Actually, on one of the pits on the island, there was one giant piece of float copper on the bottom, and it was supported by oak timbers that had been cut. Uh, there, were, there were cut marks in the timbers that they analyzed, and then, uh, so they took some carbon samples of that oak and, and placed it between five and 6,000 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is a pretty small pit. I'd love to see something bigger. After a night on the island, we're heading out to the distant North Shore to visit the Manong Mine. It's one of the largest ancient mines on the island, and I want to see if there are any clues there to who did the mining. I also want to understand just how many mines were worked here thousands of years ago. It turns out the wolves on the island could be an unexpected clue to understanding the size and scale of this mysterious mining operation. I've done a little bit of reading about this big mystery of how did we lose uh, a certain segment of the dwindling yeah. population here, the wolves? Yeah, we've had 10 years of pretty high wolf numbers, but now the wolf population has been coming down dramatically. And in 2012, this last year, they hit their lowest level ever. Just nine wolves left. Nine wolves. 
What do you think happened? Uh, this spring, we, we did find out uh, that three wolves had died in a mine shaft. Then here, we've got mm. some uh, bones of one of those wolves. This came from the shaft. This one was one of the wolves in the shaft. Yeah, we fished him out along with two other wolves. Uh, so two adult males and then a female pup. So I, I'm curious, how deep did they fall? Well, it's a, it's a unique, dangerous mine pit. I mean, even for Isle Royale, uh, about 10 feet of sheer wall down to a water surface, which was probably frozen. I couldn't hit the bottom with the biggest pole I could stick down there. So are there any other uh, large mammals, or is it just the wolves? You know, I've, we've seen a dozen or so moose that have fallen in and died in mine shafts. Doesn't that uh, tell you something about the quantity of, of mine shafts and, and abandoned oh, mines? Yeah, I mean, there's hundreds of shallow pits from mining for thousands of years. This, the one he went into, was by far the deepest and most dangerous I've seen. You know, in the article that I read this spring, they left me with a distinct impression that the wolves are probably going to go extinct. What do you think? On this island, in terms of probability, they got about a less than 50% chance. The dwindling wolf population gives me a sense of just how many ancient mine pits there are on Isle Royale. The remnants of this mining network are so vast that animals like moose and wolves can't avoid falling into the pits. This makes me more determined than ever to get to the bottom of who's responsible for taking all this copper out thousands of years ago. Now, we're on our way to the Manong Mine, which is located on the far north shore of the island. It's one of the largest mines on Isle Royale, consisting of deep pits and miles of tunnels. In the late 1800s, a thriving mining industry existed here, and hundreds of miners worked the pits. It was these miners who uncovered evidence someone else had already been here mining copper, possibly prehistoric people. And I want to discover who those people were. Oh, well, Scott, this is what I've been talking about. This is the Menung Mine. Oh, oh. Wow, that's great. Isn't it something? What's that, 50 feet? I don't know, man. It's, it's certainly a lot deeper than the other shaft that we saw. Does that go underneath there? It looks like it keeps going. It does, actually. Uh, not only can we see the shaft from the top, but we're going to go down over here, and you can see the shaft from the side as well. Taking the easy way, huh? Took the easy way, man. How about this place? This is awesome. This is incredible. This is amazing, yeah. Well, you can see plenty of copper carbonate here. That green uh, carbonate is obviously uh, break down a copper, that's a telltale sign. We see it all the time. See all these fractures sort of running in this direction? Yeah. There's probably copper in this seam right here. 
Copper has always been seen as a miraculous metal. We know now that its ions kill bacteria, which is why it's used for pots and pipes. It's valuable. That's why people steal it from abandoned homes. During World War I, more than 270 million tons of copper came from here in the Great Lakes region. But billions of pounds of copper was mined here long before modern times, maybe by whomever left the Newberry tablet behind. This is a significant operation here. There was a lot of copper pulled out of here. It goes back quite a ways. You can see the, the tracks that are left from the, you know, from the 1800 miners and as they worked over the top of the, of the ancient miners. I think the chances are pretty remote that we're going to find evidence of any ancient mining. I mean, the blasting that's been done here, whatever might have been here, is surely gone or buried. Do you think, uh, is there any chance I could get a sample from here? You know, you, you can't take any samples, any copper off the island because it is a national park and it's a preserve. I understand. But we're, uh, we're not far from the largest piece of flow copper that anyone has in their possession. And uh, I know for a fact you can take a look at it maybe get a sample. If nothing else, they have uh, copper samples from the area there that we can get our hands on for sure. George told me scientific dating on some of the pits proved they were mined 5,000 years ago. I'm convinced that Great Lakes copper was used in the Bronze Age. There may be a scientific way to link it to Bronze Age copper but I need a sample so I can test its purity. If I find a match, then someone from Europe was here mining Michigan copper 5,000 years ago, and that would mean a complete rewrite of American history. I'm in northern Michigan, investigating the disappearance of millions of pounds of ancient copper. I want to know who took it. I also want to know if there's a connection between whoever mined the copper and the Newberry tablet, which has symbols on it that I think could crack the case. I think that the disappearance can only be explained by miners that came across from Europe during the Bronze Age. I'm searching for a piece of Michigan copper that I can test for purity to find out if it matches with ancient copper discovered in Europe. But first, I'm checking out a massive example of local copper. Wow. Look at that. That's incredible. So how big is it? Over 28 tons. You know, I can see obvious glacial striations. So clearly, this is a piece that the glaciers picked up, carried it, and dropped it. Mm -hmm. We see the scratches of, of being uh, scraped along the ground as it was carried. So Judy, I just came back from the Manong mine. My friend George took me there, and we, uh, we saw some uh, some mining pits, and we talked about some of the quantities, the estimates of over a billion pounds of copper that was mined. So what do you think about the idea of ancient people coming from across the Atlantic and mining copper in this region? It's the only thing that makes sense. Where did they get all the copper needed to build the Bronze Age, when bronze is made from mostly copper? Why wouldn't they come? I agree with you. Why wouldn't they? So they have every reason to do it. What about native legends? Do you know anything about that? Well, yes, there are some stories about fair-haired, fair-skinned people having been here. And perhaps Native Americans even left a message about that. Are you talking about the petroglyphs in Copper Harbor, the ship petroglyph? That's the one. I've looked at that petroglyph, in fact, and I've done some research on it. Personally, I think it's probably uh, maybe a 1,000 years or somewhere in there, but it, it, it could be much older. I'm not sure. What do you think? That ship, I think, is so significant. It's so different from anything Native Americans would have done. The shape of the sail, it's quite square. I looked at that uh, very carefully a couple years ago, and it has uh, sort of a Minoan-style square sail. The Minoans were a Bronze Age culture from the Greek island of Crete. 
It was not until around 1900 that archaeologists discovered evidence for the Minoans, but little is known about them. What is known is that the Minoans had a huge sailing and trading empire that dated back to about 3,500 to 5,000 years ago. That's precisely the time the copper in America was disappearing. If I can test Michigan copper and match its purity with that of ancient Bronze Age copper, then I might be able to prove the Minoans were America's mystery miners. Could the Minoans have been involved? They very well could have been, since they were noted for being a marvelous mariners. We know the Minoans got farther than Crete, farther west than Crete. Um, they were looking for copper, no question about it. We have the copper here. They had the sailing technology to get here. I mean, this would be a huge blow to the standard history that we know. There is a way I think I can test this. It would be great if we could get a sample to test that copper for trace element analysis. I know I can't get a sample of this, but we might be able to get one somewhere from up here. Any suggestions? Sure. Uh, a friend of ours who has a charming shop uh, called De Upers Tourist Trap, he also is an amateur geologist. Who do I ask for when I go there? Hooli. In my search to uncover the mystery of who mined the ancient Michigan copper, I've seen photos of a long lost stone tablet found in the area, and a petroglyph of what could be a carved Minoan trading ship. Perhaps the two are connected, and the symbols on the tablet are Minoan. And if I can find a piece of Michigan copper that tests as the exact same purity as a Bronze Age sample, it could mean that the Minoans got their copper from here. All I need is some Great Lakes copper to compare, and thanks to Judy, I have a lead. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Scott Walter, how you doing? Not bad, not good. bad. Say, uh, Judy Johnson, do you know her? Oh, yeah. She said I should be looking for a guy named Hooley. That's me. That's you, OK. Yes, do you have any copper? <laughs> we got lots of copper. What I'd like to do is I'm wondering if I might be able to get a sample of copper. I think we can do that here. Do you have some I can yeah, maybe look yeah. at? Yeah, matter of fact, I was just prepping these two here. And I found them in the box downstairs. I forgot I had them. Oh. And these are, are, this is float copper. So you're familiar with the giant piece of copper back in Marquette, right? Yes. OK. Yes. So this is essentially the same thing, just a smaller version. Yeah, right? smaller okay. version. Yeah, it comes in all sizes. Say, there's one other thing I'd like to ask you about. I don't know if you know anything about it, but uh, I've been looking into something called the Newberry Tablet. Oh, yeah. It's gone now, but uh, do you know anybody might have some information about it? Well, yeah. I mean, it, when they found it, there was this big hurrah. I mean, they, they, they didn't know whether it was Egyptian or whatever, you know. And luckily, there was a mining journal newspaper guy there that took pictures of them. OK. And then they got stuck in a guy's barn, and then uh, the weather warmed down because they weren't uh, they weren't baked clay. They were just, uh, you know, in that uh, just raw form. But they have them down there in a the museum in uh, uh, St. Ignace down there, part of the tablet. Wait, wait, wait. You mean it still exists? Yeah, yeah. I was just down there, matter of fact, two weeks ago. Hooli, <laughs> the fact that that tablet still exists is really important, because if, if I could get it under my microscope, do some weathering studies, I might be able to potentially tie the Minoans with the New World up here. And <laughs> the Michigan copper mystery might be solved. Wow. It would be a big deal. I can't believe the Newberry tablet, long thought to have been destroyed, still exists. I think it's just the clue I need to solve the case of Michigan's mystery miners. When two woodsmen found the tablet by accident in 1896, they had no idea the importance of their find. When I found out it still exists, I delved deeper and discovered something else. The script on the tablet is thought to be Minoan. 
But based on what I've learned so far, I see no chance it could have been faked. That's because the tablet was discovered before the Minoan culture was even known to exist. Archaeologists didn't find evidence of the ancient Mediterranean culture until 1900, four years after the woodsman found the tablet. Now, I've come to the museum where the stone tablet is kept to conduct an analysis using forensic geology. Welcome to Fort Dubois. I'm Connie. Hi, Connie. Scott Walter. Scott, glad to meet you. Say, I'm a forensic geologist, and I was referred to you by a man named Hooley, and he mentioned to me that you had an artifact here that might be helpful in some research that I'm doing about the ancient copper culture. Have you ever heard of the Newberry tablet? Uh, yes. We have them right here. You have them? We have them. You do have them? We have them in this museum, yes. How did the artifacts get here? Dr. Benson in the 60s was a collector of many artifacts and he received a phone call from Fort Algonquin in the area and he decided why not so he looked at the Newberry tablets he purchased them he brought them here tablets and, well it came in pieces when it sort of so you have more than here. one piece yes we have more than one piece they've been here ever since they've been here ever since uh, yes okay. I understand that they were found in Newberry. Okay. And the Smithsonian analyzed them. Okay. But at that time, they had no clue. So they put them in the fraud, in the hoax. In the fraud category. Yes, yes. Yeah, I've heard so, that before. I don't know if they're a hoax or a real thing. Let me ask you a question. Has anybody looked at them in modern times, scientifically, no, no. that you're aware? No, okay. not at all. I think I can help you with that. Wow. Oh. Wow. That's a tough shape. Well, I think I'm done with the preliminary examination and uh, I have some good news and some bad news. But I'll start with the bad news, okay? Mm -hmm. This is nothing I'm sure is gonna shock you, but the, uh, the tablet's in really tough shape. And uh, it needs some attention, serious attention. Otherwise, um, just a, another handling yeah. could, it could be gone. The good news is I was able to make out some of the characters on the tablet. I know there's at least three, possibly four, maybe maybe even a fifth character that's oh, wow. still there. And I think it looks like what we have here on this photograph taken in the late 1890s of the tablet. I know for sure we have this trident figure here. It's definitely there. And uh, it's Minoan script. A weird thing. I heard of some more Minoan type you heard Stone. Of some Minoan script? Yeah, some scripts, some symbols. Beyond this? Yes. Where was that? <laughs> underwater. Underwater? Underwater, and how, how they get underwater? I have no clue. Well, I have some ideas. Is it, are we talking about a lake? Mm hmm. Okay. Where about? Northern, Northern Wisconsin area. Oh, really? Okay. Well, you know, thinking about it, um, 
that may not be so strange after all. And I don't think anybody threw anything into the lake. We have something called isostatic rebound or uplift of the land. And a few thousand years ago, what is now at, at the bottom of a lake may have been dry oh, land yeah. at one time. So if there's Minoan script carved on a tablet or on rocks at the bottom of a lake mm -hmm. in northern Wisconsin, I will find it. Well, how are you going to get to it? It's underwater. Diving. After looking at the Newberry tablet, I'm convinced the Minoans could be the ones responsible for mining the copper in the Great Lakes thousands of years ago. If there really are Minoan symbols in the bottom of a lake in this area that match the ones on the tablet, I need to see them, and I've tracked down the guy who found them. If you look back at the time of the Minoans and in the, during the Bronze Age, it took a lot of copper to make the amount of bronze that was made. I don't think uh, there's enough there to account for all the bronze, and I think a lot of people have been pondering that issue. So where did it come from? I mean, that's the question. And to me, it seems reasonable that here's where they came. That's correct. There's, there's no question. They came for the pure copper that lined the, the Great Lakes region, especially in Upper Michigan. And, and they left a lot behind to let us know that they were here. You, you found these? Underwater, 15 to 20 feet in depth. S uh, symbols made out of stone, made into mounds to match some of these. So what are we looking at here? This is um, the fish symbols, They're like a boomerang, the W. These are amazing. You know, I just got done looking at what's left of the Newberry tablet, and the W was one of the symbols that I was able to make out on that ancient stone. These symbols that I found here clearly match many of these on this tablet. So what you're saying is your symbols in the bottom of the lake and the Newberry tablet are all connected by ancient copper miners? Yes. Is there any that are still intact? In fact, there is. Not too far from here. I'd like to show them to you. You realize that if these are legitimate and they were made by the Minoans. That means that uh, we had the Minoan culture coming here thousands of years before Columbus. I mean, this is a big deal. Scott, you ready to go back a few thousand years? You bet. Lead the way.
Well, Scott, whatever those piles once were, they sure look like they've been messed with. There's not much left. Yeah, they've all been tampered with. Let's, okay. let's get out of this cold water. I'll tell you about it on the boat. guys like you that are out there looking for these things. You were absolutely right. That one structure underneath there did look like a W. It was a little flat on the bottom. You know, it didn't loop up in the middle like most Ws do, but it definitely was nicely symmetric, and it was a beautiful uh, symbol down there. There's no question about that. The symbols do match. But I have to tell you that I'm a little skeptical about what I saw in the water. The um, the rocks there look to me like they uh, had not been there for a long time, and uh, I would have expected more sediment buildup. The mounds were, were not like I found them several years ago. I don't know what the situation is there. It doesn't mean that, you know, some of them aren't legit or there are others in other places. It's not so much the mounds um, that are, make me convinced that uh, the Minoans were here, and we're still doing a lot of investigation, but we do know we're walk walking in ancient footsteps. I'm not convinced that the rock piles I just saw in the lake were left here by the Minoans, but Scott Mitchin is yet another local who believes that they were here, mining the copper from the Great Lakes region. And a simple test could help me prove it. If Michigan copper is as pure as copper from Bronze Age Europe, and specifically as pure as the ingots from one of the only Minoan shipwrecks ever found, then there's an ancient connection I think is impossible to deny. Hey, Greg. I was up in the UP, Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and I have a sample of copper right here. I understand it's very pure, and, uh, I'd like to find that out for myself. Is that something you can help me with? Absolutely. So can you tell me a little about the technology we're using today? Yes, this is a technique known as particle-induced X-ray emission, or PIXI for short. And so what we've got is a accelerator that's going to generate a high-energy beam of particles. Those are going to shoot down through that tube, and as those ions hit it, the sample will emit X-rays and those x-rays can tell you things about what's inside the sample. Am I right that NASA used Pixie to analyze the, the rocks that came back on the Apollo flights, and they're using it on uh, for Mars exploration too, right? I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. So what I'd like to try to do is use this data to compare with, hopefully, a samples of Bronze Age copper to see if there's a match. And if there is, well, this would prove that ancient miners came to North America long before Columbus, and that would change history in a profound way. Sure. I think copper mined from America's Great Lakes was used to fuel the Bronze Age in Europe thousands of years ago. I think the ancient miners were the Minoans, a culture from the island of Crete who also left behind the Newberry Tablet, which is undoubtedly old and may be written in their language. And I think a high-tech analysis I'm doing that compares the fingerprint of Great Lakes copper with copper pulled from a Minoan shipwreck could prove it. So firstly, if we look at the larger spectrum, we see these peaks that clearly are due to copper, mm -hmm. so there's, and there's lots of it. Big peak there. Yep. yep. And then if we look at the, at the finer results, the, the trace elements, uh, we see a, a bit of germanium, uh, arsenic, and some even more exotic things like aerobium, uh, terbium, and thallium. Okay. So that's a pretty unique fingerprint. I mean, these things are represented here. They're just so much smaller than the copper. Yes, they are. OK. What was the percentage of copper? Were you, were you able to determine that? Well, at least of the metallic elements present in the sample, uh, something from 99 to 99.9% .9 is copper. <laughs> 99 plus percent copper. Well, that confirms what we were told. What we suspected is that that copper was extremely pure. 
So that tells us that the visible copper that we see is very specific to those areas, and uh, obviously your results confirm that. That's great. Knowing the purity of this and the purity of the copper from the Minoan shipwreck are the same, I'm feeling better than ever about my theory that Bronze Age copper came from America. I've investigated whether copper from the Great Lakes was used to fuel the European Bronze Age. What I can say for certain is that the purity of Michigan copper is a match to the purity of copper found on a shipwreck of the Minoans, a European culture from the island of Crete prominent during the Bronze Age. The Newberry Tablet is another clue that links the Minoans to the Great Lakes region in ancient times. More than a century ago, a couple of woodsmen started chopping wood and stumbled upon this incredible discovery. This stone tablet was wrapped in tree roots, so it must have been there for a long time. They saw these symbols but had no idea what they were. Only years later would we know that these symbols were likely Minoan and the importance of their discovery. What I've seen rewrites not just American history, but also European history, and gives us new and critical insight into understanding the evolution of civilizations on both sides of the Atlantic. I'm here to unravel the deepest mysteries, and what I'm discovering might change history in a profound way. something down there. Wait a minute. Hold it. You got something here. How many items are down there, Leonard? There's two things laying down there. Is that this the whole gravesite? Yeah. Right there, Sam. It'd make him nine feet. Could be a giant. The history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're gonna investigate these artifacts and sites and we're gonna get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. Conventional history holds that the Vikings explored North America as far as Newfoundland in 1000 AD. For decades, people in my home state have believed they went further west, coming here to Minnesota. And not just any Vikings, giants. Roger, how you doing? Hey, Scott. Glad to meet you. Nice to finally meet you. Yeah. Thanks for uh, inviting me out here. Well, thanks for coming. Tell me about the situation. Well, I accidentally, I was looking for gravel to backfill my uh, my basement wall. Okay. Couldn't get to the gravel pit, you know, with the grain fields here. So I decided to find a place myself and dig for it. And I ran into bones, human bones. All in authorities. They came in and uh, determined they were human bones and they were uh, very old. Probably Native American, right? Two were Native, but there's something else interesting in this equation. We found one guy in there that his bones were huge, and they even commented that it was unusually large male individual. Did the state archaeologist come out then? The uh, state archaeologist got involved, and the dynamic was totally different. They were, uh, they wanted to get this thing buried as fast as possible. Really? 
when you talk about big bones and, and a big, what you think is a big male, this is reminiscent of uh, giants. I have something I want to show you here. It's, it's an article that talks about giants. And that was published in uh, the St. Paul paper in uh, 1888. And it says, a prehistoric race, seven gigantic bodies exhumed while digging a well near Clearwater, Minnesota. A race of giants, and they talk about them being seven to eight feet tall. Could your guy be that big? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah, he is. OK. Yeah, we're in, we're in the same category. We're in northern Minnesota. You're probably familiar with Viking Norse heritage and the idea that the Norse were here. Oh, there's no doubt. I've been studying the Norse for years and uh, what they do and the burial mound system. All this is Norse technology, and I told them that. OK, Roger, so where is this mound? The mounds are just on the other side of the cornfield, right on the edge of the Coon Creek. OK, well, I'm anxious to go take Let's a look. Let's do it. Need your help. That's where the big guy is buried. Right here, OK. Right there. His feet are about approximately right down here in this area. His head is located way up here by where that stone, that marker is. Roger, let's measure this. Take that. Yes. OK. Yeah. Well, he's about eight, eight to nine feet long. I'd say eight, six. That's a big guy. Wow. Digging here, you find bones. The state representative for the Native Americans comes out. An anthropologist for the state comes out. Yeah. And then what happened? They well, start then digging? They, talk, they started doing the archaeological dig. And their eyes got big because this guy's, this guy's bones, I, I tore his feet off. And I tore the shoulders and rib cage of uh, two of these Native girls that were shoved up against his feet. The anthropologist said these are females, they, right? They were native, female, they're little petite, and they're in the fetal position, you know, with their hands over their face. OK. Did they say yeah. that this was a giant, or they thought it could be? Or what, what exactly did they say? Very, very large male. Well out of the ordinary. There was a lot of these guys around, but uh, kept quiet. I don't know why. But uh, mm. this, this guy was covered up as fast as they could, too. So it seemed bizarre to you. There was Very something bizarre. not right about it. Very okay. bizarre, yes. Well, based on everything that I've heard so far, what it sounds like to me is you're, you're suggesting there's a cover-up going on here. It's, I, I don't see any where, why, or reason why there is not a cover-up. I mean, it's so obvious that you got an eight-foot guy sitting there. Roger, you mentioned that the, uh, the big guy was eight feet long. Yep. How do you know that? Well. After we covered everything up and quite a while later, curiosity got to me. I had to call in a friend who works the coppers. The coppers? Uh, it's copper. He's talented with, uh, with coppers. When you run over bodies, water, or whatever, they'll cross. OK, positive. so this is witching, right? Divining it's rods? witching, what you call witching. Witching is also known as dowsing or divining. Diviners insist they're able to detect underground disturbances through copper rods they hold in their hands. There's really no scientific explanation for how it works, but even Einstein believed that it did. The practice dates back to medieval times when people used to use copper rods to find everything from water to artifacts to bodies. Found an old grave from head to toe. He found that with his rods. All right, it's a little over 10 feet long. Mm. I'd like to see that. Scott Walter. Leonard Engen. Leonard, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. Roger. Hey, Leonard. How did you get into well, it? I was, my dad could do it, and I was 16 when I started doing it. So, okay. And I'm 70 now, so. A long time. Yeah. Well, I have to be honest with you, Leonard. I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical. I do know that there are a lot of people that do believe in the rods. In fact, um, they are used for finding water wells. I know that the oil companies, even Einstein, had a theory of how the electromagnetic energy could be channeled through the human body to make the rods cross. But having said that, I have an idea. And if you're up for it, how would you like to do a little test for us? Sure. I'm OK. Game. 
I've got a knife about this long. Do you think if I hit it along the grass here that you could find it? Oh, yeah. So I want you to turn around. OK. Roger, make sure he doesn't do any peeking. I just <laughs> want to double check. Are the rods going to be able to catch this knife? Oh, yes. No problem? No problem. OK, here we go. Okay, Leonard, have at it. Good luck. You hit it in the grass, too, did you? Uh, you found it. Yeah. Wow. Obviously, there's something here. You've got what appears to be a giant. And if it's a giant, it can't be Native American. It must be somebody else, maybe Norse. And if so, then there should be some other related artifacts. There's got to be something else here. We can't dig here, right? Absolutely not. You've no disturbance here whatsoever. OK. And I can appreciate that, because this no. is a Native American site for sure. Do we have some other places we could go? Yeah, we're really limited, you know, in the, uh, the cornfield and what's going on. All this, we'll have to work in my yard. OK. You want to give it a try over there? Sure. All right, well, let's, let's go. Let's do it. OK, Roger, lead the way. All right. Leonard, do your thing. We got, got some, some right here. You got something here. Right here. Is this oh, a continuous oh, oh. thing? Mm -hmm. Could you run this way, Leonard? Kind of parallels the old fence. How many items are down there, Leonard? Two things laying down there. Two different anomalies, huh? Right here? Yep. OK. I'm getting something, huh? Mm-hmm. We've got some hot spots here that you said there's something here, right? There are artifacts here. It's OK with you. Could we dig these up? Yeah. If it's up to me, you can dig as much as you want around here. OK. I've got the perfect guy, and he can come by tomorrow. We'll be here bright and early. Sounds good. just uh, tell you a little bit about what happened so far. You know, I went out to see Roger, and, and he's an interesting guy. He took me to these really incredible uh, native mounds, and he had a friend of his, a guy by the name of Leonard, who came out with uh, divining rods and located uh, what they say is a giant in the ground. After that, we went out into his property, and we identified a couple of other interesting uh, locations that they think there's something in the ground that okay. you know, I'd like you to look at. I have a great interest in pre-Columbian culture contact. You know, the one pre-Columbian culture contact that we know happened for sure was the contact with the Vikings. The one known pre-Columbian Viking site, Lancel Meadows in Newfoundland, uh, that's, a, that's an incredible distance. In terms of them being um, here in Minnesota, I, I'm a little skeptical. And uh, we'll see uh, if there's a, a giant on uh, Roger's property. You know, I don't expect you to drink um, all the pre-Columbian Kool-Aid. You know, take the sips that you want. But uh, right. you're in Norse country, and there are a lot of Scandinavian immigrants here in Minnesota. And the legends and the stories about the ancient Norse coming to Minnesota are everywhere here. I get calls routinely, uh, people that think they have runic inscriptions or ships that they found, you know, Viking right. ships. I mean, even the Minnesota Vikings, the pro football yeah. team, is due to the lore and uh, the legends. It's interesting. It's, it's a big deal in this area. It's a area. big part of local culture, obviously. Absolutely, huh. no question. You know, 
giants uh, may seem like a stretch, but there could be some related artifacts. Um, there's got to be more here, and that's why I felt it was important to, yeah. to look at Rogers' site. Now, I've learned one thing in archaeology in the last 15 years is that pretty much nothing is impossible. Hey, Roger, how you doing? Good to see you again. Nice to see you. This is my friend Mike. Mike. Hi, Roger. Nice to meet you. Mike Arbuthnot. Glad to meet you. This is the archaeologist I was telling you about. Well, I think you're going to be uh, pretty interested in this site, and I'm glad to have you aboard. Come on. Please, show me. All right. Let's do it. Well, Mike, this is... Uh... One of the sites that were marked out yesterday by one of Roger's friends, Leonard, who used a technique called water witching, is what he called it. But uh, the copper rods where they they walk and then they cross to uh, mark a dowsing. location. Dowsing. Sure, right. yeah. Dowsing is a little bit of an unconventional archaeological method. But uh, nowadays, archaeologists have a, a whole arsenal of, of remote sensing tools that they can use. Out here, if we're looking for Viking or Scandinavian occupation, and I would think that a metal detector would work best here because that's what's going to set the Vikings apart from the Native Americans. They're going to have iron. They're going to have the, the wool of left slag, uh, possibly bronze. So we're looking for metals. What would happen if we found human remains? Yeah, I gotta call the medical examiner. Depending on how old they are, we might have to bring the state archaeologist out here. We might have to bring a Native American representative. It's like a can of worms that we want to avoid as, as, as much as possible. What do we do next? Yeah, let me um, get my tools, uh, the metal detector, the screen, and the pin flags, and we'll set up a grid and start a survey. This is a good spot right here. If I was a Viking, this is where I'd want to camp out. So what I'd like to do is run the metal detector survey, or we'll set up a grid, we'll label our transect lines, A, B, C, D, and so on, and I will uh, sweep the metal detector back and forth, and if we get a hit, we'll put a pin flag in the ground, and then that's where we'll dig. OK, yeah, we're about 20 degrees off north. Perfect. Do it. Got one right here. Scott, can you uh, flag that? About here? Yeah. Okay. Got one right there. Roger. Thank you. Here we go. Right there. Another. We got a bunch of sites located here. We looked at it with Leonard, and now uh, yeah. can you show us what we might want to do here? These are all magnetic targets, so we don't know what's in the ground yet, and that's what we're going to find out. Like, is that bone? Mike, you got bone here. Pretty sure that's bone. Yep, it sure is. Oh, wow. And it looks like it's actually potentially been cut. Right there, yeah. Yeah, there's some, some marks. Do you know where that came out of in, in the wall? On um, this side here. I have a hand lens. Should I grab that? Uh, yeah. OK. Yeah, go for it. All right. We're only 29 centimeters deep. So I think we're still in the disturbed plow zone. Well, it definitely has cut marks on it. I think you're right about that. Yeah, I think it's it's butchered bone. Yeah. I think it's a rib. This was somebody's dinner maybe 50 to 100 years ago. Or maybe longer, possibly. Or, or possibly. It, it could be Native American. You could probably figure it out by looking really carefully at these cut marks mm -hmm. and determining whether it was made by uh, a metal tool or a stone tool. Sure, sure. Scott, come over here. What's up, Roger? Well, Scott, uh, we got a lot more evidence up around this area than just here. This uh, lady gave me pictures that her family found 
This is a dirt. sword. Exactly. Where did this come from? 12 miles south of here. It was found up here? Found up here around uh, 1900, a little later. 1900? Uh, around, around that area. Are you kidding me? Wow. I'm going to let Mike keep digging, but I've got to check this out first thing in the morning. Most people would look at claims of Viking swords and Norse giants in Minnesota and laugh. But to me, there's more than just legend here. In 2000, I studied an artifact called the Kensington Runestone, which details a voyage to Minnesota by a party of Norse in 1362, more than a century before Columbus. And the geology of the stone proves to me it's genuine. The runestone is what started me on a mission to examine sites and artifacts all around the U.S. that have been dismissed as hoaxes. It's why I want to help Roger Saker and why I need to get to the bottom of the mysterious sword he showed me a picture of. I'm in the area here looking into the possibility of a Norse presence here back uh, several centuries ago. And I uh, spent some time out at uh, Roger Saker's farm. Later in the day, he pulled me aside and showed me some very interesting pictures of an artifact that I understand you know a little something about. That's correct. Can you tell me something about this sword? It was found while they you were plowing. Yes, I have it here. Okay. Oh, good. Wow. Heavy. No, it's right. Who found it? It would be Hans Hansen okay. that found it three miles west of Euland, Minnesota, when he was plowing in 1911. He was uh, the first one to plow that land because okay. he came from Norway. Okay, so he homesteaded the land. Right. right. When he plowed a little deeper and, and he heard a noise. How deep do you think we're talking? Is this a foot, two feet? In the I, ground? I would probably say six to eight inches at the most. Okay, so relatively, relatively shallow. Totally shallow. Okay. Yeah. We've got a, a symbol here. I don't know what the heck that is, but it does look very interesting. This is a very unique sword. The style obviously will tell us something about its age. Have you heard anything about that? Anybody's weighed in on, on the possible age? And that had a resemblance to swords of the 14th century. Copies, an inscription was found on the Uppsala Cathedral in Sweden. The whole sword, very similar to that. Style-wise, right? Style-wise, yeah. Okay. One of the reasons that I'm very interested in this sword, I'm curious about the association or possible association with the Kensington runestone, which is a 14th century artifact, and this could be related evidence possibly from that Norse party. I do know some people that could help us. And, you know, just doing a general examination, sometimes you find things you never expected. So I think we can learn some more about this sword. Uh, Scott, before you go, I know you're interested in all these artifacts and we have part of a uh, rock that had been blasted. The original owner of that land uh, thought he saw some writing on it. Writing? Yeah. One looked like a, like a hooked X or something. A hooked X? Yeah. We have a possible inscription that yeah. has a hooked X. Yeah. The runestone has the hooked X. Oh. Obviously, you can see why that intrigues me. One of the reasons that, that I'm very interested in is, obviously, I'm curious about the association or possible association with giants, medieval Norse, or Viking Age Norse, whoever it might be. There was an inscription on it, and he yeah. blasted the rock? Yeah. For foundation? He bought it for a foundation stone. He was not interested in the history or whatever, so. I don't see anything here. So there's either gonna be something on the rock or in the foundation. This is great. Well, we've got a sword, now we have a rock with a possible inscription with a hooked X. Yeah. Right. Is there any chance we could take a look at this? Sure, I know where the place is. And well, uh, the sooner the better, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. First, I want to see the source rock for this foundation stone. If this rock you're taking me to has any characteristic marks, it'll help me identify the rock we're looking for in the foundation. Well, it should be off to the left. There's a rock down there. Oh, that must be it. Well, here's your boulder. And then watch out for the sense. Okay. There we go. That is a massive boulder. Look at this. It goes all the way over here. A couple things here. See this flat surface here? Yeah. And if you look 
at a low angle, you can see that there are scratches on it. Those are glacial striations. In the distant past, when this thing was still part of the bedrock, but it wasn't here. It was hundreds of miles up north. There's definitely evidence that this rock was blasted. The other thing is, I know what this rock is now, and it has a very unique step fracture pattern here. So if I'm able to go over to the foundation, I know what rock to look for. And if they carved on the glacial surface, I'll see those striations. Do you think he'd let me go through his foundation and, and take a look? Oh, I'm sure he would. Okay, and what is his name? Uh, Ted Hazelrood. Scott Walter. Yeah, Ted Hasselrood. I looked at a stone out in the field here, and I heard that it was blasted to help make a foundation for a house nearby. And you want to look at her? I would love to look at it. I take it it's nearby? Yeah, it's back here. OK. How old is this house with the uh, stone foundation? Boy, I don't know. I will not have the slightest idea. <laughs> <laughs> so it predates you being here, obviously. Yeah. OK. Long time, I suppose. Oh, holy suppose. cow, is this it here? Yeah. Well, that's kind of in tough shape there, Ted. Damn right. I see concrete right here. I think I see some yeah. boulders here. God, I would love to rummage around down in there, but uh, I don't think I want to go in there. It's, I don't think this so. This is too dangerous. Well, they're going to tear it down. Is this going to happen in the near future? Yeah, next few days. Was there a chance you could call me on my cell phone? Yeah. Well, that would be great. I would love to get in there and look at those mm. boulders. I mean, who knows what else is in here? I say go for it. Let's tear it down. <laughs> OK. If I can find a runic carving, like a hooked X, on pieces of the stones used for the abandoned farmhouse foundation at Ted Hasselwood's, I'd be one step closer to proving some of the Norse legends here are true. Depending on what Mike found at the Saker Farm today, Roger's Giant could also be a clue to a larger habitation site of the Vikings. Hey, Mike. Hey, Scott. Good to see you. And I thought I put in a full day. You guys really went after it. Uh, we have been busy indeed. So I know you searched in the spot that Leonard's Dowsing said you'd find something. Well, uh, how'd it go? Did you find anything good? I see some bags over here. I got some uh, some goodies to show you, for sure. So here's this, the site plan. This is every single shovel test that we dug. And uh, we had 54 metallic targets, and 49 of them were positive. So each of those mm. black dots yielded an artifact. A tooth. A tooth. Not a human tooth. This is some sort of mammalian tooth. But what it suggests is that there was probably livestock uh, at one point in time, more than likely cattle. Uh, we have evidence that there was some horse here as well. This was an interesting shovel test. This produced Native American pottery. OK. There are two areas, area A, right here, the center of the property in the north end, overlooking the waterway. Okay. This is ground zero, right? If you're a Scandinavian or a, a Norseman, that's where you're going to drop your tools or you know, whatever materials you might be holding at the time. And then there's area two, which is uh, just over there to the east. Now, area two had a uh, concentration of Native American pottery. This entire bag. Wow. That's I was all wondering. pottery. Oh, wow. Did you find any evidence of a giant? No giants. However, there's still plenty of good places to dig, and there's plenty of really interesting artifacts to find. Let's do it. Let's dig. All right. Sounds good. My search for proof of pre-Columbian Norse or Viking contact with Minnesota is ongoing. I've got an active dig looking for evidence of Norse giants at the Saker Farm and a sword I need to get in front of a medieval weapons expert I know. Now it's time to look for runes carved on the foundation stones of the old farmhouse on Ted Hasselrood's property. 
A hooked X on one of those rocks could mean the Norse were here. See you again. Yeah. Hey, Ted, yeah, how's it going? Right. Got your call, the, the house is knocked down. Yeah. Is now a good time to check out the rocks, the yeah. foundation? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Oh, there we go. Well, they got some rocks here, but let's look at the foundation. We know what we're looking for, so a dark gray or sort of a bluish gray rock. I'll look for that step fracturing and right. maybe a, a smooth, polished surface. These are glacial fieldstone or glacial boulders. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're looking for. Oh. Whoa. Whoop. Whoa. Whoop. 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 Wow. Whoop. That didn't work out the way I planned. <laughs> Here's a broken surface, but yeah. that's really not the right rock type either. This is all granite. Mm -hmm. And I would think the pieces are gonna be pretty big. Watch out here. I don't think so. Okay. Nope. That's a basalt. But here's a big flat. Flat rock. one there, yeah. Let's take a peek at this. No, well, that's that's not right either. We got this pile we saw when we came in. How oh, about yeah. if we check those out? You know what? I see something right from here, Dave. Oh, really? There are the step fractures that we saw on the rock. This is our rock, for sure. Oh, look. Look over here. Perfect. Do you see this flat surface? It's right. got the glacial striations, yeah. just like the it's, Just like in the world. And there yeah. again. You know what? I see something. Ah. No way. Look at that. There's a line there, and there's a line here. Hmm. Now, is that man-made? I, I think we have a couple of man-made characters here. That could be what um, your friend was talking about. If he saw this, I absolutely believe that's probably what he saw. That looks man-made, and this is sort of a U-shape. Uh -huh. It's not as uh, regular and clean yeah. and obvious as the runestone, but that yeah. does look like a man-made mark. Yeah. But they don't quite join, I don't think, you know? When they were blasting this i wonder if they had some tools and they were moving this around oh, that's maybe possible. they maybe they scratched it oh my goodness oh, well you know what that yeah. sure is interesting it's something. wow we did the foundation that pile this pile i think maybe we got it you know we, we found a couple of uh, what looked like characters this is probably what uh, your friend was talking yeah. about we were able to absolutely identify this. Right. The story was right. He saw something, and we found it. How's it going? Hey, I don't bug you, but oh. Teddy's my neighbor and told me you knew a little bit about runic writing. I'm Scott Walter. Ed Mars. Ed? Nice to, nice meet, to you. meet you. I was wondering if you could give me any information on that. Those are runes. That's a hooked X. What the heck? <laughs> What's this doing here? I mean... Well, I went down to Alexandria and looked at the rune stone, and. <laughs> some ink so these are Kensington runes. Well, uh, let me see if I can figure it out. Okay. okay. All right, that's an E. Now that's a backwards L with a slash, so D, W, well, the hooked X, of course. I better know that one. Oh. That's an A, R, if that's a D, Edward. There you go. Oh. Edward. <laughs> no way. That's awesome. You know, Olaf Ullman found the stone. Yeah, yeah. He found it with his two sons, the younger son was the first one to notice that there was something carved on the stone. Guess what his name was? I have no clue. I'm not making this up. Edward. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, it was nice to meet you. Well, it was nice short, to meet but you sweet, too. but yeah. Something here. What you got? What does that look like? 
Oh, wow. Okay. I'm not sure what the hell that is. It's cut bone. It's been worked. There's grooves that that would indicate uh, cutting. It's work work bone. Okay. It's dense bone too. So what do you think? No. Definitely marks on there. I got another piece here. This is this a, Ooh, a that's work piece? nice. This was uh, some sort of a bifacial tool, or at least in the process of making a tool or a projectile point, an arrowhead. Yeah. So this is evidence of prehistoric um, tool manufacture. Native American, most likely. Uh, almost certainly. It's starting to look like a minefield here. Uh, At least we gave it a good effort, but uh, Roger, uh, I think we're done digging here. and We found a lot of stuff. Yeah. You've got a great multi-component site. You've got historic artifacts. You've got prehistoric artifacts, but we didn't find any Norse materials. That's, Let's go. That's what we're looking for. Sure. But thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. You got it. Thank All you. Right, Roger. Appreciate Thank you. it. I've seen a lot, but the question remains. Was there a giant on Roger Saker's property? Mike and I didn't find any Norse artifacts, but that doesn't mean there was no Norse giant. Before I question the state archaeologists about the cover-up, Roger insists he was part of. I need to get to the bottom of the sword Bev Hildy gave me. Hey, Craig. I'm investigating the possibility of ancient Norse, Vikings, and even giants being in Minnesota in the distant past. And uh, Minnesota being my home state, I get calls all the time from people who think they found artifacts or maybe inscriptions. Yeah. I have another one here. I was recently in northern Minnesota, and uh, you've got the pictures that I yeah. sent of this sword that was found near Eulen, Minnesota by a farmer. So I'm anxious to hear your thoughts. Um, I'm sad to say it's not a Viking sword. This particular type of sword was produced by a WK and company in Germany in the mid to late 1800s. They would have produced thousands of these. They also would have sold them to the Ames Company in the United States, who was the largest sword company in the U.S. at that period of time. Uh, sold to the military, to individuals, to organizations, and I actually have uh, pages from the catalogs of both those companies. When I look at both of these pictures that you show, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a spot-on match right there. That's that sword. Yeah. Can you show me what a medieval or Norse sword should look like? Certainly. OK. Yep. Want to hold that for a second? Sure. That's what a Viking sword would appear to be in most cases. Boy, that's light for how big it is. Viking combat is very much a combat of agility, speed. It is not two guys standing there pounding each other on their shields. So Craig, are you surprised uh, that it's modern and not old? No, I was not surprised. Uh, in the course of our studies here in Minnesota, we've seen several instances where people have brought in artifacts, fence finials, uh, axes, uh, the Kensington runestone, all convinced that it's proof of ancient people prior to uh, them being there. Well, you know, you, you bring up the Kensington runestone, that's something I know a lot about. You did a really good job of pointing out factual evidence and the features of that sword that have convinced me that it's absolutely modern. However, that has not happened with the Kensington runestone. It's absolutely a genuine medieval artifact and proves that there was a party that came to uh, Minnesota that included Norse back in the middle of the 14th century. I doubt this artifact is true. An artifact that would exist from that period of time being found documented in a context that, that is defendable in the, in the kind of academic world, if mm -hmm, it were, mm -hmm. uh, would be, make a big deal. Yeah. yeah. That would be something that would really give us uh, a, a big conundrum to solve of why 
these people would have been out here in the middle of nowhere. Craig, I, I know you're skeptical about the runestone, but there's still the unanswered question of the bones found at Roger Saker's farm. My next stop is to visit with the state archaeologist, Scott Anthonson, who did visit the farm, saw the dig, and should have the answer to that question. So, thanks again. OK, Scott, I'm going to cut to the chase. Roger Saker says that he has a Norse giant on his property, and he says you're covering it up. The bone specialist that was out at the site didn't want to talk to me and referred me to you. Roger was very adamant that when they exposed the lower legs of the big guy, that she said that these were the bones of a very large male. As the state archaeologist, what's your response to that? As for the giant, I can't say for sure. There are some large people in the past, and we've seen giant claims before, but because I didn't see the bones, I can't say if there was a giant there or not. And there's some large Indian people, too. As for the Norse claim, I think I can answer that better. Um, there's absolutely no uh, European artifacts in that mound. We haven't found any on the property. We haven't found any European artifacts in the Red River Valley in, in the vicinity of his farm. So I would say there's a 99.99% chance that this person is Indian and not Norse. Whether he's extra large, I can't say for sure. Are you saying Roger Saker is lying about his claim? Roger Saker's just claiming this. I think he's sincere in this, that this was a Norse giant. But I have no lines of evidence to say that it is an, either a giant or certainly Norse. You know, our bones and our body are articulated into joints, all the way from your toe, all the way up to here. Everything is fitting in a socket. When you find bones and you lay them out on a table, you don't fit them back into the socket. You just sort of lay them in their anatomical positions. Well, if you don't fit them back in, then you measure it. Whoa, this person was seven feet tall very experienced forensic anthropologist who has looked at the bones has told me that they're five foot three inches, I think, is the tallest. So I wouldn't call that a giant. Roger Saker is, is adamant that the Norse came to Minnesota prior to Columbus. And if this was true, this would be a huge story. I mean, absolutely huge. But at this point, I haven't seen anything convincing to me that there's a giant there. But um, that door is still open a crack. Hey, Roger. Hey, Scott. Good to see you again. Oh, nice to see you. Oh. I didn't interrupt your dinner, did I? Oh, just having a little snack here. Well, I thought I'd stop by and tell you I, uh, I had a, a little visit with uh, oh, your friend. Oh, yeah. Well, that could be interesting. Yeah, and uh, talked about uh, the site over there. And uh, you said that uh, the bones that she looked at were not a giant. They were from a five-foot-tall Native American, mm. um, typical of what he sees all mm. the time. Well, so, you could uh, imagine. So I know what I've seen. I'll mm. take a lie detector's test, hypnosis, whatever you want. I know what I've seen, and he was he was huge. I have to say that I, I appreciate your enthusiasm. I appreciate mm -hmm. your passion. I understand that. I, I feel the same thing. When you know you're right about something, you, know? um, yeah. you stand by your convictions. And you've done that, and uh, <clears throat> I respect you for that. So. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And I, thanks for your help and all that. But uh, this isn't right. I mean, these, these people, <clears throat> uh, they're up to something. <sighs> I'm going to keep going, keep doing it. I'm, I can tell you this, I'm not going to give up on my search to try to get to the truth behind all of this stuff. Um, unfortunately, we didn't find anything else here, but uh, I tell you what, we gave it a hell of a good try, did we not? Yes, we did. Promise me one thing. Yeah. If you do find a giant, or if you do find a rune stone, yeah. will you call me right uh, away? I definitely will. All right. All right. Roger, I got to go, but thank you again for everything. Yeah. Thanks for all the help. Go ahead and finish your dinner. Yeah. <laughs> See you later. Kind of lost my appetite now. My search for Norse giants in Minnesota allowed me to dive deep into the myths and legends that are woven into the fabric of my home state. For many people here, the question of whether the Vikings made it to Minnesota isn't a question at all. 
my own research into the origins of the Kensington runestone has proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that a group of Norse voyagers did make it to Minnesota in 1362. The new world wasn't as new as we've been led to believe. history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're going to investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're going to get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. Because of my work, I get lots of calls from people who find unusual relics. A lot of times, they're easy to explain. But there's one that's bothered me. And for the last two years, I haven't been able to figure it out. Holy cow. All right, be honest. When you saw this, did you kind of lose your mind a bit? I did. Uh, we were down there looking for dark points, fossils, things of that nature, and we run across this, and I, I couldn't believe what we were seeing. And being, you know, a bit naive on the subject, I at first I believed it was a bison, until we started oh, yeah, getting okay. some, some opinions back that no, that's you know, it's definitely bovine. It's definitely some sort of cow. Okay. Nick Johnson and his brother stumbled on this incredible artifact. They had seen one of my lectures and called me up. The horns are very interesting. They're very prominent. They come up. They're symmetrical. So let's get this bad boy inside. Okay. All right. I had seen this symbol before, and I know the bull was used by ancient Egyptians in their rituals. But that was 3,000 years ago. It just doesn't make sense. So I examined it to see just how old the carvings were. You see this, probably some mineralization that's on the surface. It's actually in the grooves, too. See, it's sort of transition, and then it lightens up here. So what you can say is, is that the carving was done before this black material was deposited on the surface, and if, in fact, that's what that is. You know, initially, I can tell you right now, this wasn't made recently. This shows some early signs of age. This looks like a mane of some kind flowing down. For two years now, I've been studying this symbol, trying to get some answers. Bulls have been used as symbols by many groups, Native Americans here, the ancient Greeks over in Europe. But I really think that this carving could be an apis bull used extensively by only one civilization, the ancient Egyptians. Which leaves me with the question, how did it end up here?
Nigel, I have something pretty special for you today. A guy named Nick Johnson who lives down in Oklahoma near Tulsa was walking along the Arkansas River and uh, he was looking for artifacts and he found this large stone that has an interesting carving of a bull on it. And there are several people I've showed it to that think it might be Egyptian. Being an Egyptologist, were bulls popular in Egypt or what can you tell me about Egypt and bulls? Very popular. Okay. It's basically stood for you know, strength, validity. So we're talking 5,000 years ago. Okay. And it leads all the way right through to something you've probably heard of called the Apis bull, which is where yeah. they have a whole cult to the bull. I've heard of the Apis bull. It's a sacred Egyptian deity that symbolized the strength of the pharaoh and was a protector of the dead. Well, I guess now is uh, the time. Yeah, uh, are you please. Ready? Yeah, I've You're come a long to way to see this. So, uh, <laughs> what's ready to look? take a look? Yeah. All right. Well, here we go. Immediately, first reaction is that it does look like an apis bull from the top. What are? Uh, because yeah, tell me what what do you see that tells you that? Well, of course, a bull's a bull, ultimately, but the horns here like this, immediately when you first just look at it, that, that stands up. The apis bull, sometimes there's a ring through the nose, but that's later on. So, yes, obviously, it's a bull, which I, I agree with you on that, but um, this is very unusual. What do you think this is? Well, some people have suggested that this is an adornment of some kind, ah, like... Uh, right you know, something they put on the bull as part of a ritual. Is this any good for dating them? Well, it can be, right. but not knowing the history or the provenance of where this thing has been over time uh, makes it very difficult for me. And the one thing that I can say, and I'll show you in the picture right here, you can see the layers here, and the only way that's gonna happen is if you have either lengthy or aggressive weathering. The question is, how old is that? Well, the honest answer is I don't know, because I don't know where this thing has been. So therefore, the obvious thing to me that jumps out is then, why Egyptian? Why not Native American? The Native Americans, especially in the Central Plains region, uh, they would have revered the bison. Uh, more than the bull, so and that would look very different. It wouldn't have the high horns, and um, so I, I haven't seen anything like this in Native American art. Some archaeologists in the local area immediately dismissed it. What they assumed was that it was a modern creation, and it could be. Uh, the only thing that makes me pause is I see significant weathering of the groups. Let's say a group of Egyptians that that came over here. To North America in this case, would it make sense for them to carve a bull? No, they always leave the same inscriptions. They leave the name of a pharaoh in something called a cartouche, which is a rope um, which encircles the king's name. Because he wanted people to know how important he was, how powerful he was, where he could go, that he had visited that place. Secondly, it's a hell of a long way. They don't like the sea. They're terrified of the sea, in fact. They don't want to go on it. So when they do want something, say, from Syria, Israel, that kind of places, they all always subcontracted. They got merchants to do it for them. So what you're saying is, based on what you know about the Egyptians, this carving here in Oklahoma would not be consistent with the Egyptians? No. Okay. And they would have made a bigger stamp about it. They would have made a bigger uh, impression. There would have been other artifacts if they were here. You know, a lone traveler possibly, but it's a long way to get lost, isn't it? Well, at this point, I think we've, we've determined a couple of things. That's a, definitely a bull. Uh, it may or may not be an apis bull. I have to uh, go see the site where this came from. I want to get samples of this rock and compare it with some of the rock there to see, is this uh, rock in Tulsa? I have some doubts that the bull carving is Egyptian in origin but it does look old. A sample pulled from the same environment where this was found could help me figure out if it was carved in Oklahoma. My next stop is Tulsa. I wanna know if this is ancient. And if it is, I wanna know who made it and why. It's been almost two years since Nick Johnson came to me with a 500 pound stone carving of a bull. Bull symbols are found in ancient Egypt, but why would one be found in Oklahoma? 
I'm heading there to find out for myself. Hi, Scott. How are you doing? Good, how are you? The reason that we're here is we're trying to figure out, is this thing really old or not? I mean, is it weeks old, a few years, decades, hundreds, thousands of years old? And if it's thousands of years old, this is, <laughs> this is a big deal. Where did we find this thing? Aaron spotted it first and said, hey, did you, did you see this rock? So you, you, you actually saw it first? Yes, yes. And it was something I thought would, you know, catch your eye immediately. So walk over there to look at it, and here's this big bowl carved on the rock. We didn't know what to make of that. You know, what is what is a big bull doing out in the middle of, right. of the river out here? So uh, right out out here, past these rocks. So what is now in the water? Yeah, probably about. 20, 30 yards out past the water's edge. There's a hydroelectric dam upstream. They started letting water out probably 11 o'clock or so, so it started to fill up pretty fast. So after you found this thing and you've got it safe, then what happened? Well, I started taking pictures and emailing um, anybody I could find that might be able to tell me something about it, um, what it's doing out here, if anybody had ever seen it before, if. Uh, if anybody had any clue how old it could be, whether it was authentic, whether it was modern. One of the issues that I have is we've got a flowing river here, and water is uh, a rapid eroder. It makes rock break down very fast. So if it's sitting in a river that's going up and down and it's flooded, let me ask you this. Would it have been underwater today where you, where you found it? Yes. It would. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, Nick, that concerns me a little bit if the boulder was carved out there. In other words, if that boulder was sitting there and somebody carved it, and we've had the water flowing over it, it could have made those grooves, you know, in that weathered appearance relatively quickly. Yeah. So that's a concern to me. What I'd like to do is grab a couple samples okay. and eventually get them back to the lab and just compare it with this, you know, the rock that you have and see what turns out. Okay. I know that the bull carving is on a piece of sandstone, which is rock that has a number of unique physical and chemical characteristics that can help establish where it came from with reasonable certainty. If I can find the same rock type here today, it could help get to the bottom of where this carving came from. Scott, what do you make of this? This would be a great piece to take back to the lab to maybe do a little comparison with, with your carving. This is a good control sample. I think I have what I need. There's a spot five miles down river called Turkey Mountain, and there's supposed to be some other inscriptions and carvings along the cliff face that people have, have reported. You want to go down there and check that out? Let's go. Let's go. All right. Here. Should be probably about a quarter mile. We're gonna want to kind of keep our eyes in this direction. Um, there should be a fairly tall cliff. It's apparently it's pretty high up, uh, anywhere from 15 to 30 foot up from the ground. So. Okay. There's a cliff wall there. Yeah, and there's a trail right here. So let's check in here. It's, might be back up in here just a little bit. Does this feel right to you? This is, should be about the right area, yeah. All right. Watch out for the snare here. OK. It says bad dog right here. Bad dog. Well, I don't think that's very old, but it's interesting they used a pecking technique. I think we're in the right area. What's that over there? Let's go take a look at that. There's stuff all the way along here. Wait a minute, what is that? 
Right there. Well, that's modern graffiti. There's supposed to be a face around here. A face. A human face. Looks like there might be something up here. That's it. That's yeah. the face. This looks like it's a head right here. Is this a profile of a head? This is a face. All right. Which way is the face pointing? This is the back of the head here. All right. Some sort of headgear or something with something protruding out of the front of the face. And you can see a nose here. Yeah. You know what? I got to be honest with you. I don't like this. I think this is modern. I think we should head down. Let's take a look at this over here, guys. These lines right here. This this looks like it could be Ogham. Ogham is a really old written language that uses vertical lines. Irish Celts used it between the 4th and 10th century AD. There are more than 400 Ogham sites along northwestern England, Wales, and Ireland. A lot of academics, however, are skeptical about Ogham in North America. Apparently, there was a guy named Barry Fell from Harvard who said that this was Ogle and that it translated to G-W-N or Gwen. Okay. Gwen. Well, Gwen, the name Gwen, if this says Gwen, one possibility is it could be the Celtic explorer Gwen. And the Celts, if they were here, certainly would have used Ogham. You know, as I look at this stuff, I keep thinking about that river that we've been, you know, walking along all day today. and. You know, these early explorers, if they were down in the uh, Gulf of Mexico and they went up the Mississippi, the first large river to the west is the Arkansas River. And so that's the way they would have traveled. And this is literally right on the river. So it makes sense. You know, guys, I, I really like this. This looks good. And we've got a lot of other stuff here that we can use to compare. And I don't know if this connects with the bull. It might, might not. So we have a rock found in a river with a bull carving that could connect to ancient Egypt. And not too far away, we have a possible Celtic Ogham inscription carved on a cave wall. It seems like these clues are unrelated, so I need to figure out more about this ancient language and how it all fits together. And for that, I need to travel to Ireland. here to try to figure out if the Irish Celts came to America long before Columbus. And I'm also here to try to find out if this Ogham script that we found in Oklahoma could possibly be evidence of their voyage to the New World. If we could find an Ogham inscription in America written in Irish, then we would have absolute proof that the Irish were living in America in the early medieval period. Well, I tell you, the reason I'm here is we have, at least people say, an Ogham inscription in Oklahoma. And I want to try to learn more about it. Ogham is an alphabetical script, uh, which is unique to Ireland and to places where the Irish settled. It was a fashionable way to uh, record names of people in stone in the 5th to the 7th century. Can you describe to me what exactly does it look like? It's made up of straight lines, and to the untrained eye, it looks like tally marks. But the lines are arranged in a very specific way, each set of lines representing a consonant or a vowel. We have a beautiful example here in the library of an inscription from County Kerry, and I'd be delighted to take you in and show it to you. This is about the standard size of an inscription of this kind, which date from the very birth of Irish Christianity. 
So what does this inscription say? This inscription records the name of the man who either who's buried here or whose property this is. We follow the vowel line up the center and then the consonants are on either side. And it's important that they're on the proper side because if they're on the wrong side, it'll mean nothing. This is the proof that this is an Irish Ogham inscription. You know you're reading in the right direction and you know you've got an Ogham inscription. Oh. That's what you need to find in America. Only the Irish Celts used Ogham script, not all Celtic people. This particular alphabet is used only by Irish Celts and is found, as far as we know, unless you can prove otherwise, is found only in Ireland or in areas that were colonized by the Irish. Do we know how far they traveled and where do we find these? We know, we're reasonably certain that they got as far as Iceland. Did they go further to America? I don't know. You find the stone, you prove it. Well, I tell you what, I have some pictures I'd like to show you on my computer, so maybe I do have an Ogham inscription. So, Damien, here we have what some people claim is a short inscription here. This is at a site called Turkey Mountain in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Not far away, there was a very beautiful Egyptian-style bull carving found. I don't know if they're associated with each other, but it wasn't far away. What do you see here? I have to say, from, from what I can see, I see five or six lines, almost all of them vertical. And there simply isn't enough in that to be able to say this is an Ogham inscription. This bears a superficial resemblance to Ogham in that it has straight lines. But let me ask you this. If we were able to find a legitimate early Irish inscription, we could say that that was evidence of early medieval Irish contact? Correct. A legitimate Ogham inscription, absolutely. Provided it is legitimate, it works the Ogham way, and it is the Irish language that is on it, you have absolute proof that the Irish were there. And if there's one there, I certainly would like to see it. I'd encourage you to look. I believe that in Oklahoma, in the Anubis Caves, there are inscriptions which some people claim bear a resemblance to the Ogham. Why don't you check that one out? Hey, Phil. Scott Walter, how you doing? Thanks for meeting me out here. Oh, you're welcome. I'm trying to understand how a 500-pound slab of rock with what looks like an ancient bull carving ended up in the Arkansas River just outside of Tulsa. Not far from that site where this bull uh, carving was found, we also looked at some ogham. And I understand you've got both ogham and carvings that include a bull here. Is that true? That's right, Scott. I think our carvings and inscriptions that we have here are probably the best example of old world Celtic explorers coming to the America long before Columbus. And I'd love to take you to the caves. Well, I've been researching these caves, uh, the caves we call the Anubis Caves, for over 30 years now. Anubis is the jackal-headed Egyptian god of the dead. He was associated with mummification and protecting the dead as they journey to the underworld. In the late 1970s, a local rancher brought another researcher here to these caves, and she recognized the figure Anubis uh, on the cave wall, mm -hmm. and uh, that's hence the name, the Anubis Caves. So you've got Celtic writing and evidence of religious practice of the Celts, You've got Egyptian symbolism and iconography consistent uh, with them being here, a presence here. Um, and you've also got a bull carving. This whole investigation I started began with a bull carving. I mean, if this is what it could be, this is a huge discovery. I think it is. 
This is cave number one. Okay. And I want to show you over here cave number two and three. Okay. This is cave two, and you can see the markings. Oh, yeah. Right up on the wall from here. Boy, they look great. Here we go. I got her. Wow. Well, these are amazing. Now, here's some of the marks that I'd like to show you. Here's the bull, and you can see the ribs drawn in Celtic style and the horns. I mean, that's <laughs> clearly a beast. Looks like, uh, looks like a bull to me. And these lines right here, this looks like it could be Ogham. So what does all this mean? Well, this was put here 1,500 years ago by Celts who came here and made a monument to their god Mithras. I only know a couple of things about Mithraism. It's an ancient religion practice around 100 to 500 AD. Its god, Mithra, was also known as the sun god, and it also incorporated bull slaughter. Mithraism, it was a secret, a mystery religion. And this is a practice of the Celts? And it was also a practice of the Celts. You come over here, you can see the rising, setting sun. And then we have the sun god with his rayed head and crown. And then we have the god Anubis with his white crown and the flail stuck in his back, just as he appears in Egypt. Clearly Egyptian. And um, I do see some modern graffiti, obviously, right here. Modern graffiti can be very helpful with dating. It gives us a comparison. I do see, you know, some of these look like they've been aging for a while. What's your take on the, on the age of these carvings? Well, we have dated this to approximately three to 500 AD. That's very possible. That's quite old. There's a series of alignments here that only occur on the day of the equinox. So you're talking about archaeoastronomy? That's correct. Well, that's a little something I know about. <laughs> I mean, many cultures did this for thousands of years and uh, aligned their buildings and structures to align with planets, moon, the heavenly bodies. And you're saying we have that here? What happens here? It's just like going to the movies. It, we've often referred to it as the world's first motion picture. The shadow moves up across this panel into the setting sun. It tells a story of Mithras. The Celts believed that in Mithraism and that their soul came down from the heavens and then returned back to the heavens and to their god Mithras. So there's a shadow play here on the equinox, which happens only twice a year in the spring and in the fall. And it's when both day and night are of roughly equal length. It was also a significant day for many early cultures. Just as it was summer turning into fall, it also represented the change from life into death. If this shadow play illuminates these symbols, then it clearly represents something fundamental with the spiritual beliefs of whomever carved this. So this is the cycle of life? Yes, it's the cycle of life from beginning to end. So Phil, what you've told me here and what I've seen is a very detailed, very complicated um, equinox alignment here that was made by explorers that came long before Columbus. I know it's not far from the equinox. We're coming up close. I would love to come back. This is an important site, and it changes history. We'd love to have you come back. Let's do it. named Nick Johnson down in Oklahoma found this in the Arkansas River. We don't know how old it is, however. Uh, I then uh, talked to a, an Egyptian expert about the possibility that maybe this was an apis bull oh. of the ancient Egyptian religion. And he basically said, yeah, I see some things that do uh, look like it could be an apis bull. But then he said he saw some things that he didn't like that, that weren't consistent with that. 
And then I went down to the Panhandle in Oklahoma and I went to a site where I saw some ogham, I saw another bull yeah. carving, and the whole discussion of possibly the Celts coming here and carving something uh, based on the Mithraism religion. Ah. We really know the Mithraic religion through symbols and images of its god, Mithra. He had a solar crown and was holding a sword or a, a large dagger and was sacrificing a bull. And here we have a bull. It flourished from about the first century to the fourth century AD. Uh, and practitioners, they believe their souls came from the stars. What would they go through? I mean, what are some of the rituals, do you know? The Torah Bolium was an initiation where a pit was dug and uh, boards were, were put over the top of the pit. You, as the initiate, would be brought in underneath this grating. Okay. And a bull would be taken over the pit and sacrificed where 50 liters of blood would pour over you. You physically got new life from this blood from the bull. Now, if that is not a visceral uh, initiation, I don't know what is it. Well, if you're sitting in this pit and a bull is slaughtered above you and the blood is just draining out and covering, I, you would remember that. One of the things when I was talking to the Egyptian expert was he couldn't make heads or tails of this flowing lines here on the back. Could that be blood? I think you're, you're definitely on the right track there. You know, if you're looking at Mithraism, the bull symbolism was an extremely important symbol. This bull seems to represent almost an uh, amalgamation of two things. One, this Egyptian apis bull religion and Mithraism. I mean, is it fair to say that one sort of evolved from the other? Absolutely, without doubt. Mithraism actually was a reforming of the Apis religions of Egypt. Now, this is all starting to make sense. If it wasn't the Egyptians who made the bull symbol, it was somebody who was influenced by the Egyptians. Right now, all signs point to the Celts. The site that I saw in the panhandle, because of the presence of Oga, they're thinking that the Celts were the ones that were responsible. Or if they were the ones that came over here, the question is why? Christianity was around. People get chased out, and certainly it's a very strong possibility that the Celts were simply, the Celtic Mithraic practitioners were chased out. People will go to amazing lengths to find a place to practice their faith. And isn't that what North America really has evolved into? I mean, that's what the United States is. But the idea that people were coming here hundreds and thousands of years ago for the very same thing is really pretty incredible. Well, I tell you, this is an absolutely extraordinary stone. When I was down on the river, uh, looking at the site where Nick told me he found, uh, found this stone, one of the things I wanted to do is to see, did this rock come from that area in Tulsa? And it appears that it does. This is a piece of rock that I collected that is sandstone. It's virtually identical to the, this slab that the bull is carved in. You know, it answered the question for me. I believe that the bull was probably carved somewhere near where it was found. Maybe not exactly at that site on that island in the river, but somewhere nearby. It seems to me that really the most likely candidates, if this is indeed ancient, um, it has to be the ancient Celts. Joe, I've been invited back to the Anubis cave on the equinox to see this alignment that occurs at that time. And I want you to come with me. Uh, I will be there. Someone was in that cave thousands of years ago. And someone with an advanced understanding of archaeoastronomy put those carvings there for a reason. If the cave illumination is anything like what I've been told, then we're in for something spectacular. It's really gonna be, I'm sure, an amazing experience to see this whole Celtic, Mithraic religion that appears to have been brought here. And if that's true, then we have a real game changer in this whole history of the North American continent.
I'm about to witness what sounds like a spectacular illumination here in the Oklahoma Panhandle that may explain a mysterious bull carving. The alignment is taking place during the autumn equinox when day and night are of roughly equal length. Not only could this be proof of an advanced understanding of archaeoastronomy, but possibly the presence of ancient Celtic travelers in America's heartland, practicing their Egyptian-influenced religion. What I'm hoping to see is the story of Mithraism played out in light and shadow right before our eyes. Well, Joe, according to the researchers, the Celts carved this site sometime back around 300 to 500 AD. <laughs> and if that's correct, it changes history in a huge way. Well, you know, Mithraism was around for centuries centuries of time where Celtic tribes would have been influenced by Mithraic mystery religion and Mithraic practices. So, you know, if, if what you're saying is that you found uh, evidence that is old and it's showing symbolism of as 1,500 years old in, in Mithraic, what other conclusion can we come to but that there are Celtic tribes that were here? Long before Columbus. Yeah, definitely long before Columbus. Hey, Phil. Good to How see you again. You? Nice to see you. Yeah, it's my friend Joel. He's the expert in Mithraism I told you about, and very interested in seeing the alignment today on the equinox. And what do you say? Should we get after it? All right, Scott, let's get on up. All right, after you. Joe, is there evidence of Mithraism here in your eyes? It's clear. I mean, it's absolutely clear to me that, I mean, these, these symbols are so distinct. Here you have this canine figure, uh, possibly Anubis. You know, Anubis, the, the Egyptian jackal god as he was hunting for the bull. We have the sun. Uh, the sun is connected to his Mithras. And we have this figure that is clearly a, a Mithraic style sun god. Right here, we have this deeply etched bull. But I'm starting to see that this bull symbol is really important. We see it as the Apis bull in Egypt, in Mithraism, that bull that Nick found in yeah. Tulsa along the same waterway right. that would lead the people to come here that also has the bull. There's a very good chance that that's part of this whole thing as well. Well, really what we're talking about here is another example of archaeoastronomy. I mean, talking about a geographic spot that is aligned with the heavens. And this is something the ancients have done for thousands of years. Well, Phil, we're only moments away here, so uh, can you tell Joe what's going to happen with the alignment here? Sure. There will be a wedge of light between two shadows, and it will progressively uh, pan up across this panel. Okay. And as the lower shadow comes up, there will be a little knob of shadow this is going to move halfway up the sun god's face, half obscuring his face, and the sun will be half obscured below the horizon. And as the shadow completes obscuring the head, that's the moment that the sun finally dips below the horizon. Sure. And the lights go out. You can see the shadow has moved up and is now right underneath the sun god's chin. And that reflects exactly what's happening on the horizon. The sun is touching the horizon. So it's happening right here. Yeah, yeah. This is incredible. It's extraordinary. I mean, look at that. It's so clear what I'm seeing here. I mean, it is clear that Mithras at this time in the autumn, he is, he is sinking down into darkness. And there is Anubis who's going to be risen above. And Anubis, of course, you know, the, the jackal-headed god. He was the god of the dead and the underworld. And as he is risen above symbolically right there, he's risen above the sun. 
The head of the sun god is almost completely in shadow. Anubis is nearly fully illuminated and it's already starting to go dark. That is a really complex alignment. Someone with a great deal of knowledge and precision has been able to make this map, watching the shadow creep across here. They've laid out their lines, and they've had to have known something very special to have the skill and the knowledge to do this. This is incredible. Here again, we have a, a brand new chapter in American history uh, right in front of our eyes. You know, Phil, your theory that the Celtic tribes that were practicing Mithraic things came here, I mean, this is all just making so much sense now. It's really something. So let me ask you a question. How does the Egyptian symbolism, Mithraism, and the Celts all connect? Well, you know, every single one of the people that you mentioned, they revered the sun, the moon, and the stars. They knew that it was their way to keep track of everything that was important to them. I agree. This site was as important as the Dead Sea Scrolls are to biblical history as this is to Celtic history. Well, I tell you guys, <laughs> this has been incredible. We started with the bull in Tulsa, yeah. coming out of the Arkansas River. Not far away, we saw Ogham's script. And if we follow that trail up the Arkansas to its, one of its tributaries, it takes us right here and this incredible story of Mithraism that we just saw play out on the wall. It was amazing. And really the only reasonable people that could have done this were the Celts 1,500 years ago. I can't think of any other candidates. And for that reason, this site here should be, I think, designated as a national historic site and it absolutely changes history in a profound way. My search to uncover the meaning and origins of a 500-pound bull carving strongly suggests ancient Celtic explorers brought their religion to America. Celtic worshipers of Mithraism who entered into their faith through a baptism of blood from a sacrificed bull may very well have made their way to Oklahoma. The stone carving found in Tulsa could hint at their gruesome initiation. Trails of blood running from the bull's head and neck. I saw the story of Mithraism play out before my eyes in a spectacular illumination on the autumn equinox, a testament to an advanced understanding of archaeoastronomy. Everything I've learned could mean that America's first pilgrims may actually have been Celtic explorers who left clues behind. It's up to me and to all of us to figure out what those clues mean to the history of this country.